Welcome everybody to this crash course in HPC. Uh, just a reminder that this crash course will uh, it consists of two parts, this morning and another one in the afternoon. Uh, this, this course is open to all pr the participants in the summer CS summer program, but also to uh, all NERSC users. And I think that this is very good. So uh, the, the, the course is going to be presented by Rebecca Hartman Baker. Uh, she leads the user engagement group at NERSC, the National Energy Research Center for Computing Center, uh, where she is responsible for engagement with the NERSC user community to increase user productivity. Uh, she began her career at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, she, uh, she joined NERSC in 2015. And before that, she also spent some time in uh, work at the Pulse Supercomputing Center, Center in Australia. Uh, with that, uh, Rebecca, please um, uh, take the stand. All right. Thank you so much, Asni, for the nice introduction. Oh, As by the way, thank you, Rebecca, for taking your time to, you know, uh, uh, to give this course. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, I really love talking to people and teaching people cool stuff. Um, and so... I really appreciate getting this opportunity. Okay, um, I'm gonna share my screen. So the first thing I'm gonna do. So Rebecca, I assume, are you gonna uh, take uh, questions through the chat or people unmute themselves? How would you like to do this? Um, I think all of the above. So um, I, I'm about to, I'm about to show you all what our plans are here, so. Okay. All right, so here's some logistics for the course. So if it would be really nice if everybody could please um, uh, change your name in, in the Zoom to be a name that you would wanna be called. Um, you can turn on the closed captions like Andrew already pointed out in, this, in the slide that was showing before this. Um, we're going to use a, a Google Doc for the q and It's going to be a little easier than the Zoom chat. It's hard for me as a speaker to keep track of the Zoom chat, but I can periodically look through the Q&A document, and that'll make my life a little easier. Um, and so this is the URL for it. Um, and actually, the slides and videos, well, not the videos, but the slides are already available on, on the NERSC uh, training event page. So if you go to this URL, um, you can you can find these slides and also my slides that I'm going to be presenting for the course. Um, and I think most of you have already done this, but if you haven't, if you don't have a NERSC account set up, um, you can apply for a training account um, using this four letter code. So it's lowercase a, capital M, capital A, lowercase a. And again, you can find these slides on this URL is nurse.gov users training events crash course supercomputing um, and you can just you can even just get there from nurse.gov you should be able to find our training page that'll have this info okay um let's see i think there's another page here okay yes so for the hands-on exercises we're gonna log into Corey. i'll post this again when we're uh, at the hands-on exercises. And you just want to do what's called a Git clone. You don't have to know what that means at all. Basically, I have some code that's on a repository that I'm going to share with you. And you have to do what's called a Git clone in order to get it. And that'll download all the exercises, also answers. And then some useful references for when we're trying stuff out is these pages, the running jobs page at NERSC and the interactive jobs page. Those should be helpful. Um, and we have a reservation. Um, so if you're an existing NERSC user with a NERSC account, I've added you to the N intern project for today and we'll remove you later. Uh, the Cori uh, node reservations are available from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. today. Uh, we have 100 KNL nodes that are reserved. 
So in order to use the reservation, we have to use this flag, minus minus reservation equals HPC underscore course. That's the name of our reservation. And then also what um, account, so what project you're gonna be charging to. Uh, and so if you're an existing user, you're gonna use an intern. Uh, if you're a training user, your account is train XXX where those are numbers, then N train is gonna be the account that you use. And then after the reservation, of course, this reservation will no longer work. Okay, so um, I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about supercomputing and about how to, so I'm gonna switch tabs here and go to my actual course here um, about supercomputing. So I'm gonna show you um, sort of, a, um, an agenda for today and what we're gonna learn. So this first part here, we're gonna learn about parallelism and MPI. So we're gonna learn what parallelism means. We're gonna have some real life examples of it. We're gonna talk about supercomputer architectures and that's gonna kind of help you to understand uh, you know, why you might have to run in parallel and how, how these things um, are working. And then we're gonna talk about MPI which is the way that we run on a distributed memory parallel computer, a cluster, okay? And then in the afternoon, then we'll talk about OpenMP and hybrid programming. So we'll talk about OpenMP and what it is and how you use it. And then we'll combine OpenMP with MPI to finish up the course. So after today, you should be able to write a fairly simple MPI program and also include OpenMP directives in your program. That's my goal. Now I know there's a lot, it's gonna be kind of like a giant fire hose that's, you know, you're trying to drink out of, uh, but I think you should be able to pick up a lot. And furthermore, these slides are available and uh, the, the recordings will be made available shortly after. Okay, so now during this course, I really like it. It, you know, normally I teach this in person, right? Um, obviously we can't do that right now, uh, but in, in person, I like it when there are people who are listening and who laugh at my jokes. Um, that's not possible, so I'm just going to imagine that you're all laughing at my jokes, but I do hope that you will feel uh, comfortable to ask me questions. Um, and so you can ask in the question um, document, like I said there, or if, you, if it's a question that might um, need an answer right away before we move on to the next concept, then I welcome you to say it out loud. You can feel free to ask at any time. Um, I enjoy answering questions. Okay. All right, so first we're gonna get started with this section on parallelism and MPI. So, um, I also like to post pictures that are kind of tangentially related to what we're talking about. So in this case, um, if you look up the word parallel on uh, Flickr, this is one of the pictures that came up. And it's a picture of some blinds. And you know, they're all connected with this, this um, you know, rope or whatever you want to call that. And it is actually extremely symbolic about what we're going to be talking about today. So it may sound weird maybe tangentially related, but it really is, it's very related to what we're talking about. Okay, so when we're talking about parallelism, the first thing we're gonna do is talk about concepts of parallel, parallelization. Uh, and we're gonna talk about what is the difference between serial and parallel. And we're gonna talk about parallelization strategies. So here's the concept. It's, it's pretty simple in some ways, but it's, it can be a little complicated to think about it. So when you're performing any task, okay, anything that you do, it could be a scientific uh, program. It could be that. It could be uh, getting dressed, you know, anything. You have some subtasks that depend on one another while others do not, okay? Uh, so now my favorite is always to talk about food. So I grew up in the Southern United States, in case you can't tell from my accent. Um, and I learned that the best way to a man's heart is through his stomach. However, I also believe that is true 
about uh, students. The best way to a student's brain is also through their stomach. So we're gonna talk about food. Some of you, this may be lunchtime right now already. I apologize, but food is, a, is something that everyone knows, everyone eats, you know, so it's something that's readily understandable. So let's say we're gonna prepare a nice dinner. We're gonna make a dinner that consists of lasagna, salad, and garlic bread, okay? Now, most people kind of understand, at least in principle, how to make those things, even if you've never made them yourself, okay? Um, so if you think about making this dinner, the salad preparation is completely independent of the making of the lasagna, right? Like they have absolutely nothing to do with one another. So therefore you could do them at any time that you so choose and it wouldn't have an impact on the other one. Um, however, if you think about it, you know, the, the overall, the basic way to make lasagna, right? Is that you, you have some sauces and you have some cheese and you, and you have some lasagna noodles and you assemble them into this lasagna and then you bake it, right? So you have to assemble your lasagna before you bake it, right? You can't bake it first and then assemble it. So that's, that's an example of, the first one is you have some subtasks of preparing dinner that don't depend on each other, right? Salad, lasagna, nothing to do with one another. But then you also have some subtasks that do depend on one another. So you have to have an assembled lasagna before you can bake it, okay? So this is the same thing in scientific problems. You can take any sort of an algorithm for solving a scientific problem, and you can break it down into tasks. And some of those tasks might be independent of one another and others might depend on each other. They might be sequential. So that's really all it is. So serial tasks, you have to perform them in order. So you have to assemble the lasagna before you bake it. And parallel tasks can be performed independently in any order. Like you can make your salad first, you can make your lasagna first, you could try to do half and half, whatever. Um, those tasks are parallel and they don't depend on one another. So again, we're doing our, we're making our lasagna. We make our sauce, right? And then we, we can assemble our lasagna and bake it. And that's the order that we have to do this and we can't bake it first and then make the sauce last. Um, we wash our lettuce and our vegetables and stuff. We cut them up and then we assemble the salad, right? We can't do it in any other order. But the larger tasks of making our lasagna or making our salad, those can be performed in parallel. So those are parallel tasks. Okay, anybody here like to make big dinners, you know, like Thanksgiving dinner or whatever? So I do, I do. And all right, we've got some people raising hands. Excellent. Um, yes, I love to make like a big dinner and I like to do that, but it is very complicated because you have a lot of different things and you wanna get them all on the table at the right time, right? You want them to be hot if they're supposed to be hot or cold if they're supposed to be cold. Uh, and so a lot of times I do actually develop something like this, maybe not in quite this much detail, but something like this for my Thanksgiving dinner, right? Like I plan, like, okay, if I have to have the, if I want to serve dinner at a particular time, then I know my turkey has to cook for so long. And then before that, I have to get it ready. So that, so I like write that down and I have like a plan of everything. And then I can, I can put the turkey in the oven and while it's in the oven, I can go do other things in parallel to the turkey being cooked. So similarly here, we have like a graph, like a dependency graph is what I, what I would call this, of making dinner, okay? And again, this is our lasagna, salad, uh, garlic bread dinner. Uh, so these are all the different tasks that have to be accomplished and the arrows kind of represent dependencies, right? Like I can't, 
I can't assemble my lasagna until I have my sauce and I've pre-cooked my noodles and I've grated my cheese, right? Like I have to do all of those things before the lasagna gets assembled. And so in fact, what we call these places here, like this assembly, it's called a synchronization point because I could make my sauce first, I could cook my noodles first, I could grate my cheese first. Like it doesn't matter which order I do these three things in. They just all have to be completed before I assemble my lasagna, okay? Likewise with my salad, I've got to wash my lettuce and my vegetables and I've got to cut them up. And it doesn't matter if I do my lettuce first and I do my tomatoes second, it doesn't matter but all of them have to be done before I can assemble my salad. And my garlic bread, let's assume I start with a loaf of bread just for simplicity, uh, but I still have, I have to prep my butter and I have to cut the loaf of bread into pieces before I can spread the butter, right? It can't be done in any other order. Like I could cut the bread first and prep the butter second, or I could prep the butter first and cut the bread second, but both of them have to be completed before I spread anything, right? Makes sense, doesn't it? So, um, so yeah, so this is kind of maybe overkill for if you were gonna make a lasagna dinner, but this is the same kind of concepts that you would use when you're evaluating an algorithm and trying to parallelize it, okay? So I've got this, uh, this timeline here for my lasagna dinner, right? I wanna serve at 6 p.m. I realized that in that case, because I've worked back, I have to start cooking at 4.15. I have to start, um, these are all color coded. So I believe this is simmering my sauce. I have to start simmering my sauce. So I got to assemble and then simmer my sauce at 4.15. And then I've got to start, um, I, I can't remember which is which, but maybe this is grating and maybe this is the noodles. Okay, uh, and then, I assemble it and then it's baking in the background while I make my salad and I make my garlic bread. And while my garlic bread is baking, I set my table and then I'm ready to eat at six o'clock. Okay. All right, are there any, any questions so far about, uh, about this? Okay, everybody kind of understands that. Um, let me just check really fast because I have everything in one place here. Uh, do we have any live questions? We do not. Okay, excellent. Everybody's doing great here. Um, all right. Oh, somebody might be typing something. Well, okay. So we'll keep going on this. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about, okay, well, this is just a further explanation about this. So how would we, how would, how can we further parallelize cooking? Okay, so uh, we could have several chefs, each performing one parallel task. Personally, I have two uh, parallel chefs in my kitchen. Uh, one is 14 and one is six, they're my sous chefs and I assign them appropriate tasks that they are capable of doing. So for example, the, the six-year-old doesn't get to use a sharp knife, but she gets to do stuff like knead dough or things like that. Um, but this is the concept behind parallel computing is where you have multiple chefs and they're all working in parallel on solving your problem. Oh, share the QA link. That's a great idea. I should have put it in the chat. Oh, somebody did. Thank you. All right, good people in this class. All right, so now I wanna have a discussion. So that means people are gonna to have to actually talk to me as scary as that idea might be. Okay, so we're gonna talk about doing a jigsaw puzzle, okay? Who, who else besides me, who loves, who loves puzzles? I love puzzles. Puzzles, all right, all right. We got puzzle people here. Excellent. Okay, so let's say we wanted to do a an n piece jigsaw puzzle, and let's say n is a really large number. Okay, like ten thousand pieces or something. Doesn't matter. It's a huge puzzle. And let's say that 
if we had one person doing puzzle, doing the puzzle, it would take them T hours to complete the puzzle. Okay, and let's say just for the sake of argument that everyone does puzzles at, at, a, at the same rate, which I know is not true, but let's just pretend for the sake of argument that this is true. So the question is, how can we uh, decrease the wall time to completion of doing our puzzle, okay? So by wall time, what I mean is literally, you have a clock and it's on a wall and the time that elapses. So it takes me personally T hours to complete a puzzle. How can I get some help from my friends and decrease that wall time? Oh, I see somebody has an idea already. One does the edges, one does the middle. Okay, well, that could work, that could work. We'll, um, we'll talk more about it. Eat the lasagna first, excellent plan. Excellent plan, then you won't be hungry. You'll just be able to focus on the puzzle. Okay, so let's talk about it. Let's say we have some people at the table. So let's say I invite you over, It's there's no COVID, I invite you over and, and we uh, work on the puzzle at the table together, okay? How long is it gonna take us, you and me, the two of us to do the puzzle? It takes T hours for one of us. So how long will it take the two of us? All right, somebody suggests T over two, okay? Okay, we've got a few people who are suggesting that. Okay, that's that's a good thought. Um, are there any are there any issues with um, you and me working together on a puzzle where it might um, we might have let's say resource contention between us? Okay, really like people to actually um, you know unmute unmute. Okay. All right, we've got a lot of suggestions on the uh, chat here. So let's see. So Try one of the things is that there might not be a lot of space at the table where the jigsaw puzzle is. And if it's crowded, maybe each person can't work as, a, as quickly as if it was just them. Okay. You are actually one step ahead of me, Jasmine. That is very, that is a very good point. So, because you probably saw this next bullet. So if we had 5,000 of us at the table, right, it wouldn't work very well. Uh, we'd have to have a really giant table and then even then um, it, it wouldn't be very efficient. Yeah, that's a good point. So I saw other people were talking about how if I have a piece in my hand, then you can't see that piece. That's right. Maybe. Do you ever work with anyone on a puzzle where they obnoxiously have like their elbow on, on the very piece that you need? Yeah, okay. That happens to me a lot. It's very annoying. So there's gonna be some resource contention involved there. Uh, there's gonna be some communication. Hey, pick up your stinking elbow, right? Um, and all of that is going to increase our wall time, right? Because if I didn't have to tell you to move your elbow, I could have just grabbed that piece and taken it and used it. And, and then there's the resource contention. I have a piece in my hand, I'm, I'm examining it. That means you can't examine that piece. And maybe that's the very piece that you want. We might be trying to grab for the same piece at the same time. Yeah, so all of that is a problem. So now if we have even more people, so two people, we're gonna get about T over two plus a little bit of overhead. Uh, if we if we change the number of people to be five thousand people, right? Um, we can't all fit at the table, right? Um, there's going to be a huge amount of resource contention in that regard. Um, we're going to have to uh, each because I said we had maybe like a ten thousand piece puzzle. So really, like on average, each of us would get two pieces. It would not be very efficient use of 5,000 people's time to, uh, to do this puzzle all together at my table. Because I definitely can't fit 5,000 people in my house and especially not right now. Okay. 
So here's another idea, okay? This is the COVID friendly idea. Each of us, okay, we have a certain number of people. We have P people. We are each at a separate table, at least six foot distance apart uh, with N over P pieces each. And let's say for the sake of argument that the pieces that you have are all contiguous pieces. So it's not, it's not like um, random pieces that are on your table. So you can do, you know, you can do most of the puzzle yourself without help from anyone else or most of your portion of the puzzle, I should say, without help from anyone else. Okay, so how about this? So how would this work for our wall time uh, to completion? What do you think? Let's say we had two people. Okay, so I'm at my puzzle, my puzzle table. You're at your puzzle table, uh, six feet away from mine. Um, and uh, I have half the pieces. I have the left half, you have the right half or whatever, okay? Um, how's that gonna work out for us? You see any issues with this? All right, so somebody's suggesting T over two plus one step because of putting the two halves together. That's right. So we're gonna have um, we're gonna have a big extra step at the end, right? I'll have to get like a giant spatula and I'll have to like get my part of the puzzle and like bring it over to your table. So uh, we're not gonna have really any resource contention particularly, right? Because I have all my pieces, you have all your pieces, but um, there's gonna be a huge communication cost. Anytime that we need to communicate, okay? Like anytime I, I need to show you any of my pieces, I have to get, stand up, pick up the piece, take it over to you, show it to you, bring it back, sit down, right? There's a huge communication cost associated with this, this model. Yeah, okay, so the issue is that if you break it up too much, then you have another sub jigsaw where you have to figure out how to bring smaller parts together. That's right. Okay. These are all really good points. All right. All right, so now I have a, a better idea, okay? Or maybe it's not better. So there's, uh, we have this puzzle and it's like this nature puzzle. Oh, thanks neighbor. <laughs> Sorry, you can hear my uh, neighbor's car alarm. That's great. Uh, so you have this giant puzzle and it's like this landscape and it has, you know, like a mountain and the sky and a stream and a tree and a meadow, like all those things, you know, one of those kind of puzzles. Okay, uh, so what if we divide it up by features? So like, I'm gonna work on the mountain, you're gonna work on the sky, somebody else is gonna work on the stream. How does that sound? Does it sound like a, a good way to divide up the work? In fact, I think someone suggested this earlier. Perfect, yes, okay. Yes, and be sure to take the easiest part for myself, definitely. Okay, now somebody points out that yes, the mountain and the sky, they might have some shared pieces. So you have a piece, it's part mountain and part sky. So then how do you divide that up? Do you give it to the mountain person? Do you give it to the sky person? Good question. Okay, non-even distribution of work. Yes, yes, this is a very good point. So um, in art, Typically you have this like one third rule sort of thing where, where things can't be like, you can't have it um, evenly distributed. It's like, you can't have it that's like one half this and one half that. So you're gonna have something that's much bigger, that's a big feature. And then you're gonna have smaller features in order to make it you know, aesthetically nice and pleasing for people. So, so it's not gonna be even, right? Like maybe the mountain is the focus here. So, and since everybody solves puzzles at the same rate, um, then the mountain person is gonna take the longest, right? Because they have the most work to do. They have the most number of pieces. And yeah, okay, yeah. So it might be a little hard to divide the pieces that way, but this is just for the sake of argument, right? Okay. All right, so then another, another issue like somebody was mentioning is, you know, you have a piece that's half mountain and half sky, 
or maybe it's one third mountain and two thirds sky. Maybe you could figure that out. You could divide it up based on that. But then either way, when I'm making the mountain, I don't have all of the pieces that truly are the mountain. So there's going to be some kind of tension there um, and some communication going on between those, right? In order to truly fit them together, especially in the final steps. Okay. All right, so this was a good exercise for people. Um, and so we'll talk next briefly about a parallel algorithm design. So this is called what we call PCAM. Um, it's an acronym for the four steps that we go through when we design a parallel algorithm. So, so the first thing we do is we partition up the steps in our algorithm. So we decompose our problem into the finest grain tasks that we can basically think of to maximize our potential for parallelism. So we're not thinking really practically at this point. We're just thinking about how we could divide this up. Okay. Then the next step we do is called communication. So we, we try to determine what the communication pattern is amongst these tasks. Kind of like that graph that I, that I showed you of, of making dinner, right? Um, and again, we're just, we're just reporting. We're not thinking like, is this a good communication or is this a bad communication? It, it's just, is it necessary? Yes, okay. Uh, and then the third step that we, that we do is called agglomeration. And this is when we start thinking practically. Okay, so we, we're going to combine all of these smallest, smaller tasks into coarser grain tasks, if necessary, uh, in order to reduce communication requirements or other costs. So, um, so for example, um, it might be good if we were dividing up our dinner, it might be good to have one person work on lasagna only, one person work on uh, salad only, and one person to work on, you know, making the garlic bread or something. Right, so that, that might be a good way to combine into coarser grade tasks. And then uh, the final thing is mapping. So we're gonna take these tasks and we're gonna assign them to processors or, okay, or chefs, depending on what you're doing, um, subject to a trade-off between communication costs and concurrency, okay? So we'll talk more in detail about this, but this is just the basic concept of how we design a parallel algorithm. Okay, so before we go on to the next uh, part, I'm gonna look at the Q&A, and then also if anybody has any questions. I see some people have raised hands. I don't know if your hands are just raised because, uh, because you like to have your hand raised or if you really have a question you're willing to answer. Okay, so question. Would putting dinner on the table be considered another synchronization point as well? Or is that just the finished product? Okay, that's an excellent question. So I guess it depends on what your full algorithm is. If your full algorithm is to just get dinner on the table, then it's just a finished project. But if your algorithm is to feed your family, then it would just it would be a synchronization point. Okay. Okay, why does this table split avoid resource contention? Okay, excellent question. Um so it, it avoids certain types of resource contention. I mean, you're correct in the sense that it doesn't completely eliminate resource contention, but what it does is it eliminates a lot of types of resource contention where uh, you have a particular piece of the data that I want um, and I try to get it, or you are sitting on it, or you are otherwise occupying it in a way that, um, that it's readily available to me, except for the fact that you are in the way, if that makes sense. So it does, you're right, it doesn't completely avoid resource contention, but it does eliminate certain types of resource contention. Okay, good question. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about computer architecture. Unless, there's any other questions that people want to ask, maybe verbally, any, any questions? All right. So we're going to give kind of an overview of supercomputer architectures and just kind of a conceptual sort of 20,000 feet above uh, overview of architectures. Okay, so here's some real supercomputers. Uh, my favorite of all times, I think, is this Cray-1 from 1976. Um, 
So you can see here, it's kind of like rounded. Um, and, and in here, in this top part, is where the um, actual processors lived. And, and, they, and it was in this sort of round thing to uh, minimize the distance between them um, so that network would be more efficient. And then down here in this, uh, I'm hoping it's real leather for the price that you paid, but it could be fake leather part. Uh, down here, that's the cooling system for the machine. And um, they actually marketed this in a way where they said, you could put this thing, because you know it's got this leather here, right? So you could put it out in the lobby of, of your company headquarters and visitors could sit on it while they waited for an appointment with your CEO. So I really wish that they had a Cray One like on eBay or something, I would totally buy it for my living room. However, like today's, you know, pocket watch is like thousands of times more powerful than your uh, Cray One. Certainly your phone is millions of times more powerful. All right, um, so then the next one I have here is this IBM Blue Jean. Recognize that these are all a little older. Uh, Blue Jean was, was really um, an amazing machine of its times, um, very revolutionary. And its architecture is exactly the way that supercomputers are still made today. So you start with just kind of a compute chip and you put it in a node and then you have cabinets full of nodes and then you have a system that consists of many cabinets. That's exactly the way that these machines function. And then finally, I just had Jaguar here. Jaguar was my first baby, loved it. Um, it was the first machine that I really worked on. Um, and it was the first kind of useful uh, petaflop level machine. Okay. Anyway, so what is a supercomputer? Well, the definition of a supercomputer, according to Henry Neiman, who's kind of a supercomputing educator, um, is that it's the biggest, fastest computer right this minute. Um, so really what Henry's, I mean, that's a little bit inflammatory, but really what he means is it's, it's a machine that's much more powerful than just something that you could go to Best Buy and purchase or something or Newegg or whatever and get. Usually we're talking about something that's like a hundred times more powerful than the, the PC of the era. Um, and so, you know, for example, like I said, the Cray, uh, the Cray one there is less powerful than, than your iPhone. But at the time, you know, it was an incredibly powerful machine. So at the time it was a supercomputer. Uh, so you might hear a lot of these different words um, and they all kind of are synonymous but have slightly different uh, angles to it. But supercomputing, high performance computing, sometimes abbreviated as HPC um, and scientific computing because it's typically scientists who need these types of really powerful resources. And basically what this boils down to, and this is kind of nurse's business, is we have these scientists that use these really big computers to solve these really hard problems that they wouldn't be able to solve in any other way. So that's, uh, that's kind of what it, what it boils down to. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. All right, so there's kind of these two different types of architectures of these machines. So one of them is called SMP, and that stands for symmetric multi-process architecture. So in this case, what you have is you have a massive memory bank, okay? And it's shared by multiple processors. And any processor can work on any task, no matter its location in memory. And this is the type of architecture that is really great for parallelizing things like sums, loops, stuff like that. Okay. And then there's another architecture and it's called a cluster architecture. And what you have is you have these racks of nodes and in each node, you have a CPU and it's very fast at com computation and it has its own memory. And then it communicates with other nodes uh, through a network and the network is relatively slow compared to the CPU power. Uh, and so under this architecture, we would write uh, programs that divide computations evenly, but minimize the communication that they do. And the communication would be performed using a library called MPI, which we will learn about shortly. Okay. 
Now, um, today's architectures are hybrid architectures oftentimes. So you have a node and it has a processor or set of processors that have a, a lot of cores and so, and they, but they all share a memory. And then outside of the nodes, you have, you have these nodes, well, you have the actual nodes and they are connected to one another by an interconnect. So within a node on the micro scale, it looks like an SMP machine, right? Because you have, you have these processors and or cores and they're all sharing the same memory. Um, but it, from an external perspective, it's a cluster architecture because each of the nodes has its own individual memory that it does not share with any other node. Um, and so to take advantage of all of the parallelism in this, then what we would do is we use MPI for the cluster architecture of it and OpenMP for the SMP within a node hybrid programming, okay? Now there's also hybrid CPU and GPU architectures. These are very common. Um, you know, our next machine at Nurse Perlmutter is a, a, a machine with this architecture. And in this case, what you have is you have a node that has a CPU or maybe more than one CPU plus one or more GPUs. And um, the GPUs, so within the node, there are two different types of memory. So there's the CPU memory, which is shared with all the CPU cores. And then you have the GPUs, each of which have their own memory, okay? So you, GPUs are really good at one thing and that's arithmetic. And so you offload your heavy computations to those GPUs. And, um, and then you have the CPU do other things, ideally like, uh, you know, like logic or, um, integer arithmetic or, or things like that, that CPUs are better at than GPUs. Uh, it's a pretty complicated programming paradigm. So uh, we're not really gonna talk about it today, but I did just wanna mention that, you know, it is, it is very popular and it is something important that, that we need to uh, learn how to do. But for today's course, we're just gonna, we're not gonna, we're gonna ignore these types of architectures for now. Um, so people will often use CUDA to directly program the GPU. Um, however, there's other alternatives. So there's standards-based directives. So OpenMP has directives for um, GPU offloading. Um, and we're, not, we're also not gonna talk about those today, but the, they do exist. Uh, there's OpenACC, which was designed specifically for offloading. Um, and then there's also programming environments like Cocos or Raja, where you just write the algorithm and the programming environment takes care of how it happens. Um, and so those things are pretty useful, especially for if you want to have what's called performance portability, where your code will basically work pretty good on any type of architecture. So if you're interested in something like that, performance portability, um, these programming environments are perfect for that type of thing. Okay, so before we move on too much, I just wanted to let you all know that I'm not really from outer space, which you may have thought I was when we were talking about the puzzle, okay? So the puzzle thing was symbolic of these types of architectures, okay? So if you think of yourself as a processor and humans as processors, um, you think of the table as the memory for the processor, and you think of the puzzle pieces as data, okay? So that's exactly what we were talking about here. So. Our first example was a shared memory node, right? Where, uh, you know, we're both sitting at the same table and we're working on the puzzle together. Uh, the second example was um, a distributed memory, right? Where I'm at my table, you're at your table. That's a distributed memory concept. And you could see how uh, costly communication was in that scenario. So now I, I hope that you kind of understand like what I was talking about there and can relate it to these architectures and think that, oh, Rebecca, she's a little nuts, but she's not that nuts. Okay. Okay, so moving along, let's see. 
The next topic is MPI. So let's um, pause for a sec to see if we have any good questions. Um, see what questions we have. Okay. Are the main vendors of supercomputers still Cray and IBM? Uh, yes. Uh, however, Cray has been purchased by HPE. Um, and so now it's HPE. Um, but there are a lot of vendors of smaller machines. So I would say, I'd say a Cray is like a luxury car. Okay. So it's like a Cadillac or something of, of supercomputers. Um, but you can get clusters from a lot of different vendors. Um, so that would include, you know, Dell, they do them. Um, well, HPE also makes, made clusters and stuff before they bought Cray. Um, there's a lot of a lot of companies out there that will sell you a cluster, but uh, uh, in terms of getting a supercomputer that's very high end and that has, you know, specialized um, networks and things like that, it's Cray, Cray and IBM are kind of the only names in the game, and even IBM is kind of dropping out. We don't see as many IBM machines after, so they they kind of stopped making blue jeans a couple of years ago. Um, after the, the blue jean guy retired and they really haven't caught up since. Okay, when will we do the hands-on portion? So we're gonna do that after we talk about MPI. That'll be the first part that we'll do hands-on. Okay. We program something for a CPU and parallelize. Will it not work on a GPU off the bat? It will not work on a GPU off the bat. It will not. Um, okay. And then question about CUDA. Does CUDA only work with NVIDIA GPUs? Uh, currently, that is the case. Um, there are ways that you can translate it, and I'm drawing a blank on what that is called. I'll tell you at 3 a.m. when I remember. Um, but yes, but the earliest, um, the earliest machines that were in this GPU and CPU sort of model uh, were NVIDIA GPUs anyway. Um, it's only been relatively recently that we have any um, machines that are even planned to have any other brand of GPUs. But so now there's gonna be um, AMD and Intel GPUs in the, in the exascale systems that are coming around next year. Excellent questions. Okay, Sickle, thank you. Yes, and Hipify, yes, thank you. Hip is the alternative for AMD GPUs. Okay, and what does the wall time represent? Okay, yeah, wall time is just how long it takes. How long, how long, you know, you put on a stopwatch, how long is it gonna take for it to finish? That's what wall time is, the elapsed time. Okay, excellent. I'm, I'm enjoying this. Keep bringing along the questions. All right, so now we're gonna actually talk about MPI. All right. So turns out there's also these um, these ships called MPI, and they uh, install windmills offshore. So who knew? The MPI adventure installs windmills. So you can see this. I think this in the center is the um, big post of starting a windmill for an offshore windmill farm. Pretty cool. Okay, so we're going to have a little intro to MPI. We're going to talk, you know, kind of tie this into our parallel programming concepts. We're going to talk about the six necessary MPI commands. After you learn those, you'll be able to write just about any program that you want that's parallel. Um, it may not be efficient, as efficient as it would be with some more advanced um, MPI commands, but you can do just about anything you want in that case. And then um, we'll look at some examples. Okay. All right, so MPI stands for um, Message Passing Interface. That's all it means. Uh, and if somebody says to you, what is MPI? Quick, quiz, which of course we'll have one at the end. No, we won't. Um, Message passing interface is the industry standard for parallel programming. That's all it means. Okay, it's actually uh, a document. So there's a 200 page or more document that is the, that is MPI. 
Um, but then there's MPI implementations. And so MPI has been implemented by many vendors. Um, and then there's also open source implementations. Um, so, so Cray, IBM, and HPE, they all have their own vendor implementations. I'm sure there's other vendors that do as well. Uh, but then those are usually based upon one of these three. So MPitch, typically, uh, the Cray one is based on MPitch. LAM MPI, although LAM MPI is kind of going away. And then uh, open MPI. These are all the open source versions. And so typically the vendors take these open source versions and they just kind of optimize them for their own architecture. Uh, and so you use the MPI function library in writing C, C++, or Fortran programs in HPC. Now, there are also wrappers to MPI um, in Python. So you could use like MPI for Pi uh, to, to use MPI within uh, those functions or within the, the, that language, I'm sorry. But it, they, those are typically wrappers around the MPI functionality. Okay. So uh, there are different versions of MPI. There's MPI-1 and that came out in, I think the 1990s. Uh, and then there's MPI-2. And MPI-2 had uh, some additional advanced functionality and C++ bindings. Um, everything that we're gonna learn today applies to both MPI-1 and MPI-2. Uh, in 2012, MPI-3 came out, uh, had major revisions, including a lot of non-blocking collectives and extensions to one-sided operations. And it's an 800-page uh, document. So if you need a little light reading, if you're not able to go to sleep very easily, just look that one up and have a whiz, and you will fall asleep very quickly. Um, then we have uh, MPI 3.1 that was released in June 2015. Um, we're not really going to talk about the MPI 3 additions to the standard, it won't be covered today. And then we've got the MPI 4 standard. This was just released like last week. So I don't know that much about it. I think it's even longer than 800 pages. And it has a lot of really cool stuff in it. So, however, if you think about it, no one has implemented it yet. So it's not really that useful for us to really talk about it or use it very much today since we can't actually use it. Uh, and, and actually most uh, vendors have just kind of finished implementing MPI-3. So that's the, 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 the unfortunate thing, but you know, it, it makes sense, is that uh, a lot of times these implementations really lag behind when the standard has been released. So the MPI-4, when will we see that in our compilers? A um, couple of years, a <laughs> couple of years at the earliest. Okay, so I wanna introduce to you briefly here, there's some parallel programming paradigms that are very common, okay? And one of them is called SPMD, which stands for Single Program Multiple Data. Another one stands for is MPMD, and that stands for multiple programs and multiple data. And we can use MPI for either of these paradigms. So uh, here's some examples of, of this type of program. So for SPMD, again, we're writing a single program and it'll perform the same operation on multiple sets of data. So the equivalent to this in, in cooking land is we have multiple chefs baking many lasagnas, okay? So they're doing the same operation. The, the creation of lasagna um, on different data, right? They're using a, a different bag of cheese or a different, you know, different noodles than their neighbor, but it's the same operation that they're performing on their personal set of data, okay? Uh, similarly, if we are rendering a movie, because okay, that's, that's actually another application of, of clusters and high-performance computing, um, we might be rendering different frames of the movie. So we're doing the same sort of operations, but we just have different data, right? So if we're doing, we're doing Shrek, you know, in one, in one Shrek's going like this and the next one he's going like that, right? But it's still Shrek, we're still rendering him. Okay. Uh, okay, then MPMD. So in this case, we actually have to write different programs to perform different operations on multiple sets of data. So, in this case, we might have our, our chefs preparing a four-course dinner. So they're all 
part of, it's all part of our goal of making dinner, but they're preparing different aspects of dinner. Um, and then in our example of a movie, um, we might have um, you know, different parts of the movie frame. So we might have one process that's generating Shrek, and we might have another process that's generating the donkey or whatever, okay? Um, and actually in computer, in um, scientific computing, this happens fairly frequently. We have things called coupled models. So like in climate models, we might be, we might have some processors that are, um, you know, working on the ocean and some that are working on the land and some that are working on the atmosphere. Okay, so MPMD is also very common. And then within those, we have SPMD programs where we have multiple processors and they're all working on the ocean, right? Or they're all working on the, on the land, okay? Um, and that's what I'm talking about here with this. You can write a hybrid program where you have some processors that are all doing the same thing and other processors that are all doing another thing. Okay, so we'll talk about the six necessary MPI commands. So like I said, if you know these six commands, you can write any code badly, perhaps, but you can write, you can do anything, okay? Almost anything. All right, so they are called MPI init, MPI finalize, MPI com size, MPI com rank, MPI send, and MPI receive. Okay? So why do we need these? What do they do? Okay, so. MPI init, it initiates MPI, so it turns it on. You put this in your code after your variable declarations and before you do any MPI commands, okay? And then uh, MPI finalized, it shuts it down. So you just put this at the end of the code after your last MPI command for sure. Um, so typically, like if I'm writing a code, I'll write uh, MPI finalize return zero. That's the end, right? Okay. Okay, so then the next two we would classify as environmental inquiry functions. So MPI com size, that tells you the number of processes that are currently running your code. Okay. And you're like, why might I want to do that? Well, because you might want to run your code one day on four processes and you might want to run it the next day on 4,000. And so this will enable you to do that without having to recompile your code. All right, so then the next one is MPI com rank. And what this does is it finds out the identifier of your current process. So uh, with this, uh, the rank, it counts like, um, it counts like C versus Fortran. So the, the lowest rank is zero and the highest rank is size minus one, okay? Um, so uh, let me try to kind of explain this a little bit more about what happens when you run an MPI code, okay? So let's say that we're gonna run on four processes, okay, or four MPI processes. So what happens is um, when we, we submit a job to the supercomputer, we tell it what resources we need, okay? So let's say we say, uh, I need four nodes, okay? Machine gives you four nodes, okay? And then what happens is, um, let's say I'm gonna run one rank per node, all right? So um, what happens is I start my, start my code, I run it with a command that we're, we'll learn about this called S run, I start my code. Uh, and then uh, what, the, what the computer does is it starts off, it shoots off like four instances of your program. Okay, one on each node, because that's how I asked it to set it up. Okay, so, and then they're, they're essentially identical, except they each have a unique rank. Okay, so on one of the nodes, the rank is zero. Okay, because I have one MPI process running on that rank, on that node, uh, it's zero. On another one, it is one. On another one, it is two. And on the last one, it is three, okay? All of them say MPI com size is four because they all got started by the system. The system told them ahead of time, get started, you have four ranks and you node, this particular node, you are rank zero, you are rank one, 
you are rank two and you are rank three. So it initializes them in that way, okay? And then what happens is, then um, once your code gets started running, then it does its thing. It does whatever it's told to do within the body of your code, okay? Um, and and then you can you can make it do different things depending on the rank if you want, right? So you could say, okay, if you're rank zero, do these things. If you're rank one, do that thing, right? So so that's I just wanted to explain to you kind of how that all works. So I mean, that was a very lay person overview. It's not very technical, but but that's the idea. That's the concept behind what is going on here. Okay. I hope that makes sense to people. So we have a few comments in the chat. Uh, okay, is the rank arbitrary or is there some order in which they're chosen? Excellent question. Um, so there can be uh, there can be some order to which they're chosen, especially if you have multiple ranks within a node. Okay, uh, and so so the uh, so there are they're like environment variables that you can set that will help it decide that. Um, and I don't remember exactly what the default is, but a lot of times it'll it'll go like, this is getting a little technical, but it, it'll go depending on like um, NUMA regions. Um, so it might go like, okay, I'm gonna put one in its own region here. I'm gonna put the next one in its own region and the next one in its own region and the next one within a node. Um, now, outside of that, outside, you know, like between between nodes, like why is this one rank zero and this one rank one? Uh, I don't actually know if I don't know how it, how it makes that decision. Um, I don't, yeah. So um, my guess is okay. So typically, they will get you'll get like a node list, and I do think it it typically will follow. Um, the node order. So like all of our nodes on Cori, for example, they have a number, okay? Um, so if you have, you might have node 126 and node 127. So I think typically it'll give you like rank zero is on 126 and then rank one is on 127, but uh, but that could be false. I, I don't actually don't actually know that that, that is true, okay. But that's an excellent question. So thank you for asking it. Okay, so moving along to sending messages. Okay, so now we have we have we've started MPI. We can start MPI. We can end it. We can find out what rank we are, and we can find out how many ranks total there are. But now we got to actually send messages, right? Like, how would it be message passing interface if we can't pass any messages? So that's the remaining two functions here. We've got send and receive. So with send, here's what we're going to do. So we've got a buffer. This is super confusing probably to some folks. So we've got a buffer and that's what this represents. And this is basically the space where we've stored the information that we want to send to someone else. Okay. We've got this count. This means how many items are in our buffer. And then we've got this data type thing. What that means is what kind of items so we've got how many items and what kind are they stored in this buffer? Then we've got a destination, like where, where are we sending this to? So that's where, that's, that's where this knowing of ranks comes in pretty handy. Um, and so we're gonna send it to somebody else. I guess you can send to yourself, but it, you probably don't want to if you can avoid it. Uh, and then tag, this is just so like, Maybe you're going to send multiple messages to processor three. Okay, so you want to you want them to be able to decode like, oh, this is this kind of a message versus that kind of a message. So that's what the tag is for. And then MPI com communicator. Okay, so a communicator is kind of like a universe in which you're communicating. Okay, so when I when I start my program and I have these nodes and I'm running it on those. That is my MPI com world. That is like the whole universe of, of MPI processes to which I am allowed to communicate, okay? So the machine kind of gives you that limit, like, like this, this, I don't know, this bubble 
in which you are allowed to communicate and interact, right? Like my, my MPI processes, they can talk to each other, but they can't talk to yours that's running your code, right? They have, they have to just stay within this. And furthermore, if I have two jobs running, they can't talk to each other either. My first job just talks to itself and my second job just talks to itself, okay? And so MPI Com world represents all of the things that you're able to talk to, okay? But you could also create a different communicator that is like a subset of those. So I could create a communicator that was all the odd numbered processes if I wanted to, okay? But for this course, we're just gonna talk about MPI com world, okay? And that's just the global communicator. It's just so much easier. Um, and that other stuff is pretty advanced. So we won't really go there. But I just wanted to explain that to you that you could make a subset. Okay, so this is my example here. So I'm gonna send this value of X. Okay, I'm gonna send it, it it's, um, okay, so let me back up here. So when we have this buffer here, I know this looks a little bit scary, probably if you're not a C or C++ person. What this really means is, give me the memory address for this thing that you wanna send, okay? So in this case, I have a, a double X. So somewhere in my program, I typed double X semicolon, okay? And, and then this ampersand, what that means is the location in memory where X is, okay? So this is really all I'm doing here is I'm just giving you the address of X, its location in the memory, okay? And then this is one because I said it was just a double that was just a scalar. It's not, it's not, um, it's not an array, okay? So it has a length of one. It is a double. I'm gonna send it to my manager. Manager. Um, manager here, I just define that as an integer. It's the destination. Okay. Typically, um, especially in simpler algorithms, we might have what's called a manager worker type of algorithm where we have, well, a manager who tells all the other ones what to do and then they report back. Okay. So um, kind of like me and my sous chefs, right? My kids, like they're, they're my workers, I'm their manager. <laughs> um, so uh, in this case, I just put myself, me, I'm just saying that's my rank. That's just kind of arbitrary. You could put whatever you want in there, but it does need to match up so that the, uh, when the message is received, that uh, the, the tag matches. And so there's a generic thing called MPI any tag, it's a macro that you can put in there. Uh, okay, and then uh, MPI com world, like I said, this is like our global communication. This is like the set of all other MPI processes that we can possibly communicate with, okay? All right, so let's go on to receive. So receive, is pretty much the mirror of send, right? Because we have a send, we gotta receive it. Um, and so if we receive a message, um, it's gonna, it, it, again, it parallelizes, it parallels what we just saw. So in this case, this buffer is where we're gonna receive it into, okay? So you send me a message, I have to have a place where I'm gonna put it in my memory, okay? Um, and then this is the size of it, right? The count, it's the same thing. The data type, so what type of data we're sending? Is it a double precision? Is it a float? Is it a, a integer? Whatever. Uh, the source, so this is who, who is sending this to me? Um, and then a tag. So we wanna have a matching tag here, if uh, possible. Uh, the communicator, which again, we're gonna use MPI com world for all of our communications. And then a status. So this is the new part here. So the status is like, did I receive it? Was it a successful receive? Or was there something that went wrong during it or whatever? So normally this status is just gonna be success. Yay, we received it. Okay, so here's my example. So this is, this is again, parallel to what was just sent, right? So the, so the other process sent to the manager. 
okay? And then uh, the manager is gonna receive it. They're gonna say, okay, here's my address of X, because I really needed that information about what X equals, right? I needed that from, from my uh, worker process. Uh, it's a size one. I know I'm just receiving a single double, just a, a double. Uh, and my source is from that other processor who sent it to me. And they used their own identity as the tag. And then the, the, this is within my world communicator, okay? So this global world in which I'm allowed to communicate, I'm using the whole thing. And then um, this is my status of how did, how did this receive turn out, okay? So something to think about is that both of our standard send and receive functions can be blocking. So blocking means um, you're not gonna move on until the operation has completed. So MPI receive is gonna return only after the receive buffer contains the message, okay? So I'm, if I'm receiving, I'm gonna stick my hands out here and I'm just gonna wait and I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna wait until you send me a message or until the program ends, <laughs> okay? Uh, MPI send often does block, but it may not block. Uh, so we gotta watch out for something called deadlock where we're just stuck, where we can't go forward because nobody is progressing. All right, so here's an example code that I developed uh, solely so that you could see an example of deadlock, <laughs> okay? So what this code does is if you have two MPI processes, neighbors in rank, they will send something to each other. So um, if, I'm, if I'm process zero, then I'm gonna tell process one, I'm gonna say, hey, my rank is zero. And I'm gonna send them the number zero. And if I'm process one, then I'm gonna to send to process zero, hey, my rank is one. I'm just gonna send them the number one, okay? So that's what this code is supposed to do, is process zero sends process one uh, zero, and process one sends process zero a one, okay? Um, so let me try to explain this. So. One thing is we've got to include mpi.h, okay? That's the header files. And this is a C code, I should mention that. Um, so I kind of define all my variables here in these first two lines of my main code. And then I initialize mpi, and that's what mpi init always pretty much looks like. So you should just do, do that. Uh, and then I get the size of the world. So I want to know how many processors there are out there that are in my program that are running right now. And then I get my personal rank, okay? That's me. Okay, so this code, I only run it if we have an even number of, for my size, right? Because I'm saying, you know, we're gonna pair like zero and one, uh, two and three, uh, four and five, right? So if we have just another process six, just hanging out there, there's not, not any point in running this code. So I just quit immediately. If, if that's the case, if we have an odd number. Uh, and then I have like, okay, if, if I am an odd numbered process, I'm gonna send to my neighbor less than me, right? Cause I said like zero and one, they exchange, right? That's, that's what I wanna do. Zero and one, they're gonna exchange information. So if I am one, and then I'm gonna send to zero. If I'm zero, I'm gonna send to one, okay? So the first thing I do is I wait, okay, I'm gonna get a message from my friend, my, my neighbor, my pairing, I'm gonna get a message from them. And then when I get the message from them, then I'm gonna send my message, All right? It seems reasonable, seems reasonable, but does anybody see the problem here? Oh, okay, so first somebody had a question about, can you send two different kinds of data types? You sure can. Um, there's way to send pairs. Um, usually easier to, to use to send functions depending on, depending on what you're doing. 
both programs are waiting, right? Nobody has sent any sent anything. Right, right. Because like, because like I said, what happens is the computer creates these two programs that are running simultaneously. They own, and they're doing the same things. They're following whatever our instructions are in our code. Okay. So the first thing that happens is we figure out what our ranks are and we figure out who we're expecting a message from and who, and also who we would send our message to. And so the first thing that we both do is we both stick our hands out and we say, okay, send me a message, send me a message and I'll stop. And, and, and MPI receive lock, deadlocks, right? It just, it just sits there until, you're, until it receives a message or until the end of time or until your computer gets decommissioned or your job quits or whatever. It's gonna sit there and just be like, hey, hey man, where's my number? Send me my message, right? But you're both simultaneously sitting here going like this, hey, send me my message. And, and nobody is sending any messages. So that's why we'll have a deadlock in this code. Very good. All right, so then if we flip it around, um, if we have MPI send first, so this is the same code as before, but we have MPI send that goes first and then receive. So then we're sending a message and then we'll receive a message from our neighbor. But first we're gonna send them a message. Well, how's that gonna work for us? So it kind of depends on how, uh, how MPI send is implemented. So typically they, this is also something where they're not going to uh, finish, okay? It kind of depends. So, so some MPI sends um, like for small values like this, they're like, oh man, that's, that's nothing. I can send that and then just move on. But if you're sending like a really big, uh, you know, like array full of stuff, then um, at, at a certain threshold, it'll definitely block. So, um, so this is also not very reliable because we're kind of depending on like, how is the MPI implemented on this particular machine uh, compared to the size of what our message is. So in general, this would, this is like just a little bit, it's kind of dodgy, let's put it that way. Like you wouldn't, you can't depend on it to work. It, it may work, but uh, we don't want to write a code that's not performance portable, right? We want to write a code that'll work anytime. So this is then what we would need to do. So this is the same code, again, doing the exact same thing, except what we've done is we're going to have whoever is the um, even number of the pair, they're going to send first and then receive. And then whoever is the odd number of the pair, they're going to receive first and then send. Okay. And what that'll do is that'll that'll make sure that there's always a, a send and receive pair that are you know that are happening at the same time. Okay. So does that make sense to people? What kind of questions do you have about this at this point? Yeah, it is. If you don't know C, yeah, if it, it's a little bit confusing. Well, I could have done Fortran, but that would probably be even more confusing to some of you younger people. Okay, um, let me just see. Okay, so I kind of have a summary here of, of exactly what I've already said, but the always deadlocking example is logically incorrect and deadlock is caused by the blocking MPI receives and everybody's waiting for an MPI send to actually begin, which never actually happens because the MPI receive is in the way, blocking the way. Okay. Then the other one, uh, you could have a deadlock caused by your MPI sends competing for buffer space. This is especially true if you're sending like a big message. Um, and so it is unsafe because it depends on your system resources. Um, and so the solution to that is to reorder the sends and receives like the third example, um, or use non-blocking sends and receives 
um, or other kind of advanced functions from the MPI library, um, but we're not really going to cover those today. So, but there are non-blocking sends and non-blocking receipts. Okay. Let's see. All right. So we're going to go into our computing, but first, let's see if we've got any more questions in here. Okay, what is a wrapper? Okay, good, someone else answered it. Yeah, a code that calls another code without doing any real work. It's kind of a translation, if you will, of that code. Okay, are there any notable differences in general MPI use or writing between MPI one to four? Yes, there are quite a few differences. I mean, because MPI three and four have a lot more capabilities than MPI one or two. Um, but in this course, um, whatever we do here is it is compatible with MPI three and probably MPI four. Although I confess I have not yet um, read that uh, standard. Okay, in MPI Comreg, size is the MPI Com size. Yes, sorry if I was not clear about that. Uh, okay, and then is MPI com world just a set of nodes or could it be something else like some destination outside of the cluster or no? Uh, no, it's really, um, it's really nodes within your job. That's really all that uh, MPI com world includes. You can't really, com uh, you can't really communicate outside of your job. Are MPI data types the same as those in C++ and C? Uh, yes, and also Fortran. So there are, there's a whole list of MPI data types, um, which you can look up in the MPI standard. And they have, uh, yeah, they are, yeah, they are basically the same as those in C++ or C. Um, and then also they have some that are exactly comparable to uh, data types in Fortran. Okay. Can you have MPI abort a send and receive after a certain amount of time? Um, yes. However, not with the vanilla MPI send, MPI receive. So there are, you know, like zillions of other MPI. Um, I think, I think in MPI, let's see, I think in MPI 2, I think there's something like, somewhere between 250 and 300 different uh, MPI um, commands. Uh, and then there's even more when you get to MPI three. So there's like just about anything under the sun that you could imagine that you could do. You could probably do it in MPI. All right, those are great questions. Thank you all. Um, and then I think there's some things in the chat, so let me check. Oh yeah, MPI for Pi. That is the one that that works the best if you're using Python. Oh, so Fortran wouldn't be a good idea. Yeah, I figured Fortran was not the best idea here. Um, so yes, for and for Python, you can definitely use MPI uh, using the MPI for Pi wrappers. Um, the reason that we're not really talking about MPI, or I'm sorry, about Python in this class is because Python is really not, um, not a high performance computing language, okay? I mean, Python is an interpreted language. And yes, I know it's like partially compiled. It's, it's all very confusing, but um, those languages do not perform as well on the machines and, and also you don't have as much control over how they perform. Um, and so that's why we're really focusing on C, C++ or Fortran um, because you have a lot more ability to um, influence the performance of your code. I guess that's the best, best way to say it um, in those. And also I'm not, I'm not aware of a way that we would be able to use OpenMP in uh, in Python, I'm sure it does use it behind the scenes um, in some of the libraries that you might call like scientific libraries. Um, which see, I mean, I guess with with Python, typically the the things that are trying to be performant in Python are written kind of behind the scenes 
in C, C++, or Fortran. Um, and then they're just, they just kind of have a wrapper into, uh, into Python. But, uh, but the, the things that are actually doing the work are in, uh, are in one of these workhorse languages like C, C++, or Fortran. Okay. All right, awesome people. So next we will talk about our first little exercise. It is so much fun. Okay. Uh, so we are going to compute pi in parallel. So if you don't know me, you don't know that I'm like obsessed with pi, okay? Um, I really love pi and not just the food, I mean the number. Uh, and so it's all about pi for me. So this pi right here, is you can't see it because the resolution is not very good, but it is written like this is 3.14159, blah, 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 blah. Like this pi is made out of pi, which is pretty cool, I think. So we're gonna compute pi. And the reason we're gonna do this is because it's actually easy to do in parallel. It's easy to break down in parallel. Uh, in real life, you, we would not wanna compute pi in this way ever at all. But in this case, it's pretty fun. So that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so we're going to talk about our little project here first. So we want to compute pi. We can compute it using what's called the method of darts. Okay, so like I said, method of darts, actually a terrible way to compute pi. If you're going to compute pi in real life, you don't want to do this. But for this exercise, we're going to have fun and we're going to compute pi using the method of darts. So the method of darts is based on the fact that the ratio of the area of a square to the area of a, a circle that's inscribed within the square is proportional to pi, okay? So imagine you have a dartboard with a circle of radius r inscribed within a square, okay? So if you, you, know, you do the, the geometry and you do the math stuff, you can figure this out, right? So uh, the area of the circle is pi r squared. The area of the square is the quantity two r squared, so that's four r squared. You take that ratio, pi r squared divided by four r squared, it's pi over four, okay? So that's, so this is great. If we can calculate sort of an approximation to the areas of these, these things, uh, then we can calculate pi. So that's pretty cool. So how can we find these areas? Well, let's pretend that we had this dartboard and it was in this square inscribed within it. Uh, and we threw darts completely randomly in the general direction of that square, okay? So what we could do is we could count the number of darts that land within the circle of our dartboard and the total number of darts that land in the square. Uh, and we can take the ratio of those numbers and that will give us an approximation to the ratio of the, of the areas. Uh, and so, that's how we're gonna compute it. And so the, the quality of our approximation is gonna increase with the number of darts. So if we throw more darts, uh, we'll get a better approximation. Um, unfortunately, it in, uh, the quality increases fairly slowly. So um, if we wanna get an additional decimal place, then we need a hundred times more uh, darts thrown. So it's not a very efficient way of computing pi but it's fun and easy to understand. Okay, so you may, you may not have understood when I told you how much I love pi. Uh, so I, I, um, I made a method of darts cake uh, for the celebration of Pi Day. I'm like super into Pi Day, y'all. Uh, in 2009, I made this cake. Uh, so I made a square cake. And a round cake, and they had the same, uh, same diameter. And I decorated it with sprinkles, and that was my Pi Day cake. I didn't actually count the sprinkles though to see if if I got an accurate uh, number for pi. Uh, as you can see, the square cake is not really exactly square, but it was close. And more importantly, it was delicious. And yes, not enough sprinkles for a good approximation. Excellent. Okay. All right. So then that's great. Everybody, I think, 
hopefully you kind of understand how we did that, but how do we simulate this on a computer? So uh, the first thing that we would do is we would just decide on length R, maybe R could be one, that would make our lives really easy, right? And then we can generate pairs of random numbers, X and Y, such that uh, X and Y are within negative R and R, each of them. And then, then we calculate, so if X, and y is within the circle. So x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to r squared. Then we just add one to our tally for inside of the circle. And then at the end, we just find the ratio of you know, what was inside of the circle versus how many total darts did we, did we throw, okay? And we can even further simplify this, right? Because we could just take a single quadrant of, of that larger square, right? and we would still get the same answers. So really we can just have numbers that go between zero and one. Any, any objections, any objections? Oh, okay, everybody, everybody's cool with it, excellent. Okay, so um, in order to do this, we have to have a random number generator, okay? And we have this one, and it's called, this, this type is a linear congruential generator, okay? Uh, and these are actually really bad, um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so this is our, this is our serial code if we are writing this in C. Uh, and so we're gonna include, our, include this. What this does is it, since some of you are not familiar with, with C, um, it, pound include and then a file. What that does is it basically, it takes that file and it prepends it to your code. So that when it gets compiled, it's uh, the compiler will see any kind of functions that are defined in there, okay? So this is my serial code. So I have, I'm, I'm gonna do uh, a million, trials for just for the sake of argument here. Um, I have um, a total, this is this, this uh, variable is going to represent um, how many darts get within the circle. I have pi, which is what I'm going to be computing, my x and my y. I'm going to have, I'm going to set my r to be one because that's easy. And then I computed r squared just in case I didn't have a one here. Okay, so then I'm gonna loop through. I'm gonna like do um, i equals zero, i is less than the number of trials. So I'm just gonna loop through zero to 999,999. And I'm gonna calculate two random numbers. And then I'm gonna see if that's less than r squared. And if it is, then I'm gonna add that to my number n circ, which represents how many landed inside of the circle. And then when I'm done, I'm gonna compute pi. So pi is four times the number of, that I got inside of the circle divided by the total number of trials that I had. And then the reason I have these words double here is what that does is that converts this from being an integer, and in this case, a long integer, uh, to being a, a double precision number. Otherwise I would get zero because see, that's how it does it. So in this case, this is changing this to, um, to a double precision number divided by another double precision number, and then we'll get a double precision number out. And then at the end, I just print it out, okay? And return zero. All right, this is my random number generator. So a linear congruential generator, what it does is it relies on having sort of these, these three terms that are um, what we would call uh, mutually prime. So there's no factors in common in, in these numbers. Um, and then what it does is it just uses this thing. So the idea is you multiply the last random number that you had by the multiplier up here. Uh, you add this add end, so this number, and then you do mod of P mod, okay? And, um, and then you get your next random number. So uh, this is kind of my area of expertise. So I'm gonna get a little nerdy on y'all here, but uh, 
so random number, there's no such thing as actual random numbers. So what you do instead is you create uh, what, what would be like a sequence of numbers. You generate a sequence of numbers that seems random, okay? Um, but has good properties. So there are numbers that are sort of random, but ra these types of, those types of things tend to be kind of clumped in and um, just don't have good properties to them to be able to uh, create good statistical outcomes. Uh, so instead you create this uh, sequence of numbers that is so long that it that you can't like tell that it's a sequence of numbers. Um, and then also it's reproducible. So if I run my code twice, I get the same answer, which is a good thing because if I'm trying to debug my code, you know, then I want to be sure that that I that it's um, that it's reproducible. That I can do the same thing twice and get the same answer. All right. So I see some see some comments in the chat. Oh yes, C does have a random number generator. Um, the C random number generator is it is also it does reproduce. Um, and I used to use that in in this class, uh, but um, it's also not a very good random number generator. And also uh, this one brings in more exciting challenges than that one. Okay, good. Okay, so if you're a, uh, let's see, if you're a Fortran person, I've got a Fortran code for you. So this is the same code, uh, except we're going in a little different order. So we've got the random number generator here. Okay, so we already saw that before. Uh, and then we compute pi. And so we're doing the exact same thing. So in, in, uh, in Fortran, you don't have the, the term long for integer. And also it's not int, it's integer, uh, but you have integer times eight, and that is a long. Um, and then you have real numbers instead of uh, floating point or double precision. Um, okay, but it's the same thing. Um, also Fortran is so ancient. Um, I, I love Fortran, don't get me wrong, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't use a lot of operators like, uh, you know, like a, a less than sign. It uses this dot le dot thing to determine less than or equal. Okay. Uh, and, and actually, I mean, that's not strictly true. You can use those, um, but this is more traditional Fortran. This is, um, I guess this is probably a Fortran 90 code. So anyway. So let's think about parallelizing um, our code. So what tasks are there that are independent of each other? And what tasks have to be performed sequentially in our algorithm? Um, okay, so I'll get started. Oh, somebody has a comment, good. All right, generating darts, yes. And then and the ratio, we have to compute the ratio after the darts are thrown, yes. And every element could be done in parallel. That's right, so we could, we could all, if we all got together, we had us and a million of our closest friends, right? We could, we could all throw a dart, each of us could throw a dart and then we could add up the results and we could get, get the result uh, and uh, the dart throwing is independent of each other. It doesn't matter like if I throw a dart first or if you throw a dart first, it doesn't matter. They're independent. Every element in the loop could be done in parallel. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we've kind of figured that out. So we're gonna decompose our problem into fine grain tasks to maximize the potential for parallelism. So yes, the finest grain task is the throwing of a single dart. Um, and each throw is independent of all of the others. So if we had a huge computer, if we had a million possible nodes on our computer or MPI processes on our computer, we could assign one throw to each processor. Yeah. All right. Next is communication. So if we were going to do that, um, then 
all of our processes, they would have to communicate back to somebody who would be responsible for computing pi. So in this case, we are going to have another um, manager worker type of algorithm. Um, and, and so all of the workers would communicate with a manager who would then uh, compute the result of pi. Now, typically, if we have a manager worker type of algorithm, oh, I should, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry, agglomeration. So we don't actually have a million uh, processors, amazingly. I mean, I, I forgot to reserve that resource for us. Uh, so also, if we were going to do that, if we were going to have like each process compute like one value and then send, you remember what I was talking about, how communication is so much more expensive than computation, right? Computation is very easy to do. Communication takes an extremely long time. So we would need to uh, do some agglomeration here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide up the number of dart throws evenly between processes so that each of them is gonna do like a, a share of the work. So let's say if we had, uh, you know, so we're gonna do a million dart throws. We're gonna have four processes. Um, each of them is gonna do 250,000. Right, Does that sound reasonable to people? And that's gonna include the manager because the manager's work is pretty trivial at the end. Okay, so finally with mapping. So we wanna assign the role of the manager. It, traditionally, we assign it to processor zero or to rank zero. And the reason we do that is because there's always a rank zero, but there's not always a rank N, you know? So, we're going to say processor zero is going to receive all the tallies from all the other processors and it'll compute the final value of pi. And then every processor, including the manager, will perform an equal share of dart throws. Okay, does that sound like a plan? Does anybody have any uh, comments or questions about that? Can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. So in the code that you write, since the same one is sent to all of the processors, like they'll all include the last calculation step, but you'll just say like, if you're equal to zero, then you do this. Is that true? That is exactly right. That is precisely what you will do. Thank you. That is, I couldn't have said it better myself. That is exactly what happens. You're going to write the same code and then depending on who you are, what you're going to do, right? Another thing is, if you're if your processor is zero, you're going to compute the final thing, but you're also going to be collecting, right? So everybody's going to be sending stuff to you if your processor is zero, and if you're not processor zero, then you're going to be you're going to be the one who sends, not the one who receives. If that makes sense. Okay, so we get cloned it. I hope um, so. Uh, I know I gave you that link earlier of how to get clone it. And then we're going to copy um, these two files. If you're going to do C or if you're going to do Fortran from the right uh, directory, and then we're going to parallelize it using these six basic MPI commands. And we're going to call our new code darts-mpi.c or .f, depending. Okay. Um, so I think this is something where we probably want to do it together. Okay, so let me just um, do that. So as it happens, I, okay. So if you go to the uh, nurse page, you can, uh, so this is the command that, that you want to have done. Um, if you haven't done it, um, I can give you a minute to do it. Um, and the way that you're going to find this is in this. So let me just, I'll tell you what. A lot of you have, are in this Q&A already. And so I'm going to put it at the top here. Oh, that's cool. Does that work for people? Okay, you should be able to look at that. And then um, the other slides, first slides. Just uh, copy that in there.
That is so cool. That's so cool that the Google will let me do that. Okay. All right. So ever, if, if you can get into this, um, then please go for it. Um, and then here I have my um, Corey login up here. So let me show you. Um, let's see. I can exit. No. I, okay. Yeah, I'll exit. Okay. So what I did was I logged into Corey. So I did SSH. Um, so now I did, I can just do this because my username on my machine here is the same as my username on Corey. But if it's not, then you need to do, so let me just, there are a couple of different ways to do it. The easiest way is just your username at corey.nurse.gov, SSH in that way. Okay, so I'm doing that. Uh, in my case, I have um, SSH proxy set up already. So I didn't have to put in my password because I have a, a limited time um, certificate that says it's really me. Okay, now when you log in, you get this thing, which is called the message of the day. It's pretty uh, long. <laughs> okay. Uh, then I'm going to CD, CD means change directory, to my scratch directory, and I can just do it like this, dollar sign, capital word scratch, if I can spell scratch correctly. All right, and I'm in my scratch directory. Oh, I love the uh, translation. It said I'm in muskrat directory. That's very fascinating place to be. Okay, now if I do an LS, you see, I have already done this. Okay, so I already downloaded everything, developing with MPI and OpenMP. I already downloaded it myself. Okay, why should we be on Scratch? Um, because that's just a good place to have this. You could be in your home directory if you'd like. Uh, Scratch, the reason I'm on Scratch is because I can download, I have a big quota, I have a big, uh, storage quota on Scratch uh, compared to what I have in my home directory. And also Scratch uh, performs better than, um, than the home directory when I'm trying to run a job. You only see the dark sweet deer. Oh, okay, good. Okay, that's interesting. Well, that, okay. So that is exactly what you will see. So if I go in there to this, I see the Dart Suite. Okay, and if I do the, if I do LS of Dart Suite, I see C, Fortran, and run all the SH. So what I wanna do, uh, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do C. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy, uh, let's see, Dart Suite slash C slash darts, let's see. I'm gonna copy it to this directory. I'm gonna call it darts-mpi.c. Even though I haven't really uh, used MPI on it yet, I'm just gonna call it that for now. And then I also wanna copy the dot H from there, so. Uh, LC generator that age. Okay, there's a cool thing called tab completion. So you can start typing the first few letters and then you type tab and then it will complete it if you didn't know that one already. And um, the reason I'm putting dot, dot means right here, wherever I am. Okay. Okay. Now I am going to, oh, we have a lot of. Um, okay, where do I want you to copy it to? I just want you to copy it to a different place that's not that directory. Uh, in my case, I've copied it to this directory. Okay, so I'm still on my scratch. I'm just one, I'm just within here. Um, but you can copy it to wherever you want as long as it's consistent. Okay, so now I'm gonna edit darts-mpi. I'm gonna use the VI editor. Um, I don't know if y'all have ever used that before. It's 
there's kind of a uh, religious war, I guess, about oh, what? Okay, I see somebody says no, <laughs> not used anymore. Okay, um, there's one that's called Nano. That is pretty easy text editor. If you've never used a text editor before, I would recommend trying Nano. Um, it it's um, fairly simple to use. Okay, all right, James, you and me. Okay, Bryce, uh, I don't know if we can be friends. I'm just saying. All right. Uh, okay, so I'm going to edit this Dart Smash MPI. Now you can see uh, in my in my file here, it's kind of it's kind of like color coded um, for different things. So that's pretty cool. So the first thing that I really need to do is I need to include mpi.h. I can spell h instead of m, that would be good. mpi.h, okay? So, and I'm also paranoid, so I save all the time. I like to save after everything that I ever do. Okay, so what that does is that enables... Okay. It... All right, so some people may not be able to log into court. So you can, if you look at those logistics slides, um, you can sign up for a test account, okay? And so, uh, I, should, I mean a training account. So once you get your training account, then you should be able to SSH into Cori with your training account, okay? And then once you're on Cori, then you would want to um, do the Git clone on Cori. Um, now, if you already did it on your laptop, um, you could definitely use your laptop. You may need to install an MPI library. Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly how to do that. Um, I know that like there are MPI libraries that you can install on your laptop, and it'll do the same stuff. And in our case, we're doing such a small code, um, it's not going to like really bog down your laptop. Uh, this code takes you know seconds to run so shouldn't be too bad okay so i have included mpi.h now big things that i want to do is i want to use i want to be sure to use uh mpi right so first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to put in a new line here and i'm going to do uh mpi init Oops, new capital I in it. And then ampersand argc, ampersand argv. Now, what is argc and argv? Argc is the count of the number of arguments that are input to your program, and argv is the actual arguments. And why does MPI in it need them? I don't know. It just does. It, that's just what you do. Okay. And then at the end of my file here, just before my return zero, I'm gonna put MPI finalize. Okay, so now I have an MPI code. So if I just uh, if I just compiled this and ran it, then what would happen is uh, it would execute, let's say I ran it and I wanted to run on four processes. It would execute four instances of this identical code, okay? So my output would be this printout. See, this is a printing thing. It would be this printout four times. That'd be it, okay? It's not really, I mean, it is parallel code in some sense, but it's not really parallel, parallelized. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, Next, what are we gonna do? Okay, so we wanted we want to divide up this work here, right? So we want we want everybody to have their own number of trials that is equal to their fair share of the amount of work, right? So how are we gonna figure that out? Is there anything that we can use for that? Oh, I'm sorry. Could I explain why it would do four times? Oh, that was just an example. That was just a hypothetical. If I were going to run it and I said, 
uh, use for MPI processes. Sorry about that. Yeah, and, and Kongbo is right. You specify it on the command line when you run it. When you run your code, you tell it how many MPI processes do you want. And, and Bradford there has exactly the right thing. It's exactly how you would run it. Okay, oops, I saw another thing, another question. What text editor I am using VI? Okay, even though I know that's a, it's a very risky move in the, in the uh, religious war between VI and Emacs. Okay, um, so we're gonna need to define some new variables, right? So we need to know like what, you know, how, how big is the, um, the size of, of what we're doing here. So like how many MPI processes are we gonna run? So that's gonna be, um, I think we can just use the word size and we're gonna have to know what our rank is. So we'll call that just rank, okay? We're gonna need those variables. Does everybody kind of understand that? Because we gotta know like, we gotta know uh, how 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 many you know split how how is how are we going to split up all this work? That's the first thing we need to know, and then which part of the work am I going to be doing? Okay, so um, we're going to also have to have a variable. I'm just going to call it my num trials, and that's going to tell us. How many trials do I personally have to do? Okay. And then that's going to be what we're going to use right down here my num trials. Okay. Any questions on that? Is that too weird so far? Probably not. Okay. So next we got to actually. Um, oh, okay. Yes. If you've never used. VI, I would not recommend using it. So to quit, you do colon Q and push enter, and that will quit. Okay, um, so I would use one called nano. That's available on here. So if you do like nano dart stash mpi.c, then you will be able to edit. You're unable to use nano. Oh, you may need to load a module. Module load nano. Okay, so the long data type is an integer. It's just an integer that has more space to store the total number. So it's like a big integer. Uh, and then is my num trials essentially the number of trials per process? Yes, it is. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, where are the slides that show how to set up an SSH account? Try my password. Okay, um, unfortunately, I don't know that I can do that much for you on that. But in this in this crash course thing, there's this logistics slide and, and that should be able to help you to try to get your account working and set up. Okay, I unfortunately can't really um, help you that much with that at this time. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, insert some stuff here. So we need um, we need to get our size and rank, right? So MPI um, rank, I'm gonna need that here. And again, I, I haven't filled in what's in there because I can't remember it off the top of my head right now. And MPI um, size. Okay, we're going to need those there so that we can figure out what is what is the rank of the, the process that is currently running in this particular instance right now. Okay, and what it and how many total are there. Okay, and then uh, let's fill those in. So um, I am going to go ahead and use. Um, you know, use this example here because it has correct um, stuff in it. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to look at that while I'm looking at this. So MPI com size is MPI com world. And then, okay. 
Correct. That's what I thought. All right. Uh, so MPI com size is MPI com world. And then um, ampersand size. And the reason we've got the ampersand is because it's always about, in MPI, they're always like, give me the memory address of, of the place that you want to put this data in, and we'll put it in there. They're not interested in what the name of the variable is. They just want the location and memory. Okay. MPI com world ampersand rank. Okay. Now, um, so let's just put a little space between those. Okay. Uh, so the next step is going to be we got to calculate my num trials, right? So uh, my num trials is going to be equal to. Uh, let's say the total number of trials uh, divided by the uh, size of the MPI world, right? So for example, if we have uh, uh, four processes and we're having a million dark rows, everybody gets um, 250,000. So that would work. However, if we had three processes, then um, that doesn't divide evenly. So everybody's gonna, there's gonna be one left over. So uh, in order to accommodate that, um, we need um, num, okay, this is confusing. Num, so this is this this is the remainder remainder okay this is not quite right um okay i think i know a better way to do this If rank is less than num trials mod size, okay. So what I just did there. Let me just um, put more parentheses because you can never have enough parentheses in my opinion. Okay, so what I did there was if, um, so we're gonna have some leftover uh, things, right? So if, let's say we had three processes and we have a million dart rows, then the problem is if we divide by the size, then everyone is gonna get uh, 333,333, right? If you add that up, you know, 333,333 times three, uh, you get 999,999. Okay, I'm a little busy. I'm hungry. Okay, go ask Dad. He's gotta be here. Uh, and then, um, uh, so then we have one leftover that we still need to accommodate for. So what this next line here does, is it accommodates for any um, leftovers. So every so there's gonna be a few processes that get uh, one extra piece of work, okay? So then we do our number of trials and we calculate how many landed inside of the circle, okay? So the next thing to do is we got to either send or receive this information, right? So if um, if my rank 
is um, zero, let's say, because I'm the manager. Then, then um, what I'm going to do is I am going to try to uh, receive uh, from all the other processors. So we'll put stuff in there about that. And then I'm going to compute pi and print it out, right? That's what I'm going to do if I'm rank zero. So all this stuff belongs to me. And then otherwise, I am not that processor. I am going to um, send my data to processor zero. Okay. All right, um, I recognize that we are going past the time that I said we would go past. Um, right, why do we have to do this yet? Yeah, we can't miss the number of trials because they have to add up to the total number of trials of the. So we, okay, have we defined size and rank yet? Yes, so good question. So here's what's gonna happen in this code. Okay, um, so as we as we go through here, um, the so let's say we're going from a processor's point of view here. Okay, so processor starts up the code. Okay, starts up the program, initializes MPI, and when and that tells it that tells it what its rank is and what the size of the communicator is. Okay. So then it can retrieve that information here. So let's say uh, we're on processor number two, just for fun. And there's a total of four of them, okay? Uh, so then we're gonna calculate, okay, I know that there's a total of four and that we have to do a million trials. So I'm gonna do uh, a million divided by four. I'm gonna do 250,000 trials. Okay. So then I do that. that. That's how I computed this here. And then this makes up for if we have a couple of extra uh, remainders. So if um, so, then I go through my two hundred and fifty thousand trials, and I collect into this n circ. I collect what I've received or what I've calculated. You know, the the ones that ended up in the inside of the circle. Okay. Uh, if um, so then what's going to happen here, I guess, is that um, we got to receive from other processors. So uh, if I'm processor zero, which I'm not, because I told you I'm processor two, then I would receive all this information. I would calculate time. If I'm processor two, then I send my data to processor zero. Okay. So we can work on that right now. So this is going to be MPI send, and then um, I'm going to look at this again because I never can remember these things. Okay, so it's going to be ampersand, you know, whatever the name of my variable is, one, and, and there's, so there's an MPI log, and that's what we'll use, okay? So, so we're going to do n circ. It's of length one because it, we're just sending it a single number. Um, and then what did I say was else that was? Okay, well, who am I sending it to? I'm gonna send it to zero. Uh, and then um, for a tag, I'll put my own rank just for giggles. And then uh, let's make sure that's that's it. Uh, so then we're just at MPI com world. 
Okay, so we sent our data. That's it. So we need to do is send our data. Now to receive it, that's going to be trickier, but it's kind of almost the same. So MPI receive, you know, it functions the same way. It's just um, this is who we're receiving it from. So we're going to receive it from processor J, let's say, and they sent uh, their own J. Okay. So I'm going to make a Let's see, int j and total. And I'm going to initialize total to be zero. Oh no, I'm not going to initialize it to be that. I'm going to initialize it to be my own. Okay, so ncirc is what I received what I got when I'm processor zero, because I did some of the work too. So in, okay, then I'm going to do that. I'm going to make a for loop here for J equals one. J is less than size, J plus plus. Okay, so I'm getting info from all of the other processors. That's what I'm doing here. And I'm going to um, process it in some way. Total. Yes. Okay, so in C, C++, you can do this. Plus equals, this means I'm adding this other thing to it. it um, Okay, so then after I've received everything, then I'm going to compute pi, and instead of using ncirc, I'm going to use total. And I'm going to change this from saying in parallel, or serial to saying in parallel. Okay, so now I've read my code. I don't know how you all feel about this code. Could be, could be uh, you could be not there yet. I will tell you that um, there's a solution in what you downloaded in the Git clone. There's a solution there. Uh, so you should be able to look at that as well to kind of see what happened here. So um, uh, if anybody has any more questions, I will, um, we're overriding NCERC with MPI receive. We are overriding NCERC, yes, with what we received in the MPI receive. Is NCERC being assigned to J or total? Total. NCERC is being assigned to total. It's being added to total. Do we need to receive the info sequentially? We definitely do not. We could, um, we could rework this. Um, the point is we know we have to receive size minus one messages and they may or may not be coming in this order. Um, and so in fact, what we can do um, is instead of these J's, we can put MPI any rank. I believe that's what it's called. Okay. So those are um, wild cards. So that means, yes, we could receive from process three before we receive from process one this way. That's absolutely correct. That's a very good point. So the for loop isn't needed. The for loop is needed because we need to receive that many times, right? Because we have to receive from each of our individual processes. Um, however, we're going to, we could run into issues if, if we had more than one uh, send from each process. But in this case, we know we just have one send from each process because basically this line here, MPI received with MPI any rank, MPI any tag, that just accepts anything that comes in. Excellent questions. Okay. Does MPI any rank cause duplicate ranks to be called? called? Um, okay, so what MPI any rank will do is it will 
allow you to receive for this particular receipt uh, a message from anyone, okay? Um, and the, the send, you can see down here, the send is very particular. The send is sending to zero only, okay? So only zero is ever going to be the recipient of our, of our um, message. And it's gonna be from a specific rank. But um, we just need this, we just need to receive and my, you know, um, size minus one messages. And this, and the loop is the way to do it. Am I missing the MPI type? Thank you, Johannes. Of course I am. Let me make sure I put it in there. Okay, so it's going to be. Thank you. Uh, we would have, we would have found that out when we tried to compile, but thank you, MPI long, and we need that here. I appreciate you uh, looking out for me there. Okay. I had a question that I think got passed over uh -huh. in the chat. Do we, since all of these workers have the same random number generator, do we not have to worry about them all producing the same random numbers? We sure do. <laughs> That's why this makes this really fun. Yes. Okay. Yes, that is a really good point. Um, so what we need to do, um, let me show you. Um, in this, there's this thing called random last. So what we can do is we can just change that because this is a global variable effectively. So we can just set random last to be our rank in the code. That was good because I was gonna, uh, you've saved me some time here. Okay, so we'll set random last to be equal to our rank, whatever our rank is. And that will at least help us. We'll still have, uh, we'll still have bad results, but it'll help us. Okay. Well, why is it bad to have the same number occasionally generated? Okay, um, well, so what will happen is if we don't do that at all, then what that means is that every process will start at the same random number and end with the same one, right? The whole time. So they will, all four of them will get the exact same answer if we were doing like four processes. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm obsessed with four right now. But the reason that, um, that that's bad is that because then effectively you've only done 250,000 unique dice or dart throws rather than a million unique dart throws. But shouldn't the random number generator give you a different number? Um, so it's based on this random last number. And, and so if you start all at the same random last number, then they won't give you different numbers. Okay. Um, in addition, actually, there's only about 700,000 unique numbers. So yeah, exactly. All the darts would effectively land in the same identical places on all four processes. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, try to compile this, and we'll see how that goes. And then we'll I'll run it briefly, and then um, we'll have lunch. <laughs> so I apologize for going over so long. I didn't expect to go over this long. Okay, so if I do cc darts, darts dash mpi dot c. Okay, so cc is the name of the compiler on Cori. It's the name of the C compiler. And then um, I'm gonna make this into um, darts dash mpi, an executable called darts dash mpi. So let me see. Oh no, mpi any rank is undefined. Okay, I probably had that one wrong, exactly what it is. So let me just look that up. Any source. Okay, sorry, people. 
told you bad. It's MPI any source. All right, let me try that one more time now. Oh, it also didn't like my, oh, it didn't like my uh, thing because I didn't have a, all right. Well, I forgot about that. In uh, MPI receive, we also have the status, right? At the end. So that's another variable that we need up here. Okay. All right, so did you all see how I saw that? So, so these are two errors that it told me about. It said, your line 38 is not good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so that's, that's how I learned about that. Now let's cross our fingers and, oh, it did compile. Okay. So um, I'm gonna run this on a single node. I'm going to do that. I can't always remember my logistics here. This is why this is really handy. My reservation. Okay, so I'm going to do um, S alloc. I want just one node. I want it for uh, 30 minutes. But I'm not going to use it for all 30 minutes, trust me, because I'm going to eat lunch here soon. Um, I'm going to do this reservation equals HPC underscore course. Minus A and intern. And then I've got to do minus C. Yeah. Oh, and I did minus n, but I didn't do a number. That was silly. Okay, so I'm doing minus n one. I'm just going to use one node. Okay. So it's getting me that uh, resource here to take it, you know, just a little minute. What did we put at the top to find MPI status? It was MPI underscore status and then the word status, which is my new MPI status variable. Oh, error package config. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Okay. Uh, so Bradford, all of you all, we don't want to actually use MPI CC. We just want to use the, the standard Cray compiler, um, which is just called CC. Okay. Uh, so, all right, so I've got my nodes, got my nodes, and um, I'm going to run my job. So we use s run. That's, that's what we use to run a job. And then we put a lowercase n minus lowercase n, and then we want to put however many um, MPI processes that we want to do. And so I'm going to do uh, MPI. Okay, so I'm gonna run it on one process first. This is equivalent to serial. It'll take it a little bit. Okay, so look, I got 3.141648. That's not too bad, not too bad. Okay, so next I'm gonna run it with um, a two. This is the big test, y'all. It's gonna work, cross your fingers that it's gonna work. Okay, so it did work. Um, it didn't get a very good value of pi, and there's like a million reasons why that I won't go into today. But uh, let's try, I could go up to 68 actually. 
because this node has uh, 68 cores. See how we go there. It's gonna get a really garbage one, I bet. Oh, 3.140580. All right, that's very fascinating. But, okay, we've run our code. It kind of works. And now it's time to take a break. So let's have a, let's, let's try and come back if we can at one o'clock. Um, and I'm sorry that we got so far behind and I'll try to go a lot faster in the afternoon. Could you, could, you bring up your, could you bring up your C file just so we can take a look? Yes, absolutely. All right, I'm gonna quit my, um, quit my job there. <laughs> Not my literal job, my compute job. And we will look at it. Um, is that good? Um, I can probably try and make my thing even a little bit bigger here so that we can, you can see more of it. Oh, good. Okay, that showed up more. Um, let me just come down a little bit so you can see the more interesting parts. Okay, um, so somebody was asking about why is it so bad? Um, it's primarily bad because of the pseudo random number generator. <laughs> That's primarily why it's bad. Okay, no available nurse hour balance information for user train 504. Um, I don't know about that. Okay, um, Bradford. I don't know exactly how to solve your problem either. Can we see the lower part of the file? Yep, sure. Um, that's it. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to leave this on, I guess, until um, one o'clock. And I'll come back. I'm going to turn off my um, my camera, and I'm going to go feed my starving child who came in here, wandered in here, wondering about food. <laughs> so um, I'll be back at one for more fun. Righty, welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a great, although short, break. I try not to uh, keep going over like that. Okay, so um, the next thing we're going to talk about is some more MPI directives that are called MPI collectives. Okay, so uh, what this means is uh, communications that involve groups of processes. Uh, so we're going to talk about the following collective operations. So talk about broadcast, gather, scatter, reduce the all prefix of the above and barrier. Okay, so a broadcast, the motivation here is maybe you have one message and you need to send it from a manager process to all of the worker processes, okay? So you could just send them individual messages, you know, that, and that would work. So again, you, you could do this with the six basic MPI commands, uh, but it would be, kind of inefficient. So instead, they, they've created a broadcast command called MPI bcast, um, and it is more efficient. And the, and the reason that it's more efficient is, is that um, if you send individual messages and you have like, I don't know, a thousand processes that you're sending them to, you're gonna send a thousand messages. Where broadcast works is it actually, uh, generally underlying uses a tree. So like I send to two processes, they send to two more, and they send to two more. And so then you end up sending a log of the number. So broadcast is more efficient in, um, 
and it's simpler. So this is the this is the format of the broadcast command. So this is again, you remember from before we had a buffer, and that's like the place where either the message is located in the case of the root of who's sending the message, um, or it's where you're going to receive the message into. Okay, so uh, this count thing is again, it's it's just like send and receive. This count is uh, how many uh, how many items are in your buffer, and then this data type thing is what type of items those are. This root is who is the broadcaster, so who is sending the message, and then this communicator is the communicator like we were talking about. And typically, we just use MPI com world. Okay, so that is what you can do for a broadcast. Now, perhaps you have something where you want to have all of your processes send the same or a similar message to the manager. Um, so you could do this uh, by having all of them call MPI send and then the manager looping through MPI receive. Hmm, that sounds rather familiar, doesn't it? Um, or you could use the gather operation. So again, the gather operation it functions as a, um, a as a tree, but it's the opposite tree. So, uh, so it, it it funnels the information in to the uh, to to the manager process or to the root, rather than sending out from the root. Okay. So um, the the messages that uh, the root is going to receive are concatenated in rank order. So in the first place is the message from processor zero. In the second place is the message from processor one, et cetera. So, uh, so we've got this MPI gather. So we have this send buffer and the send count. And the, this count means how many things am I sent is, is an individual process sending. It doesn't mean how many things are being sent total. Um, and then there's the data type of the send type. And then there's a receive buffer and how many things they're, they're receiving. Uh, and then the receive data type and then the, the root. This is the identity of the process, the rank of the process that is going to be receiving all of the information and then the communicator, okay? So, uh, so this could be really useful if you needed to receive messages from um, a whole bunch of other processes. Okay, um, next is, is it going to go? Oh, okay, I just wanted to mention that with gather, you might have some processes that need to send a longer message than other processes. So um, this could come up if you have, let's say that you are trying to compute the potential energy of a domain on a domain and you want, uh, and, and so the way that you would do something like that is you would break it down into pieces. So you would have like different parts of the domain and then you would assign the work for each of those parts of the domain um, to, to different um, processes that are in your, that are running your program. Um, and you may have, you know, a load imbalance, right? You may have more, um, more pieces of the domain than um, an even number of, that, that would, um, you know, evenly divide in, onto each of the processes. Um, so some may have more work than others. So, so you may be wanting to send sort of some kind of progress of how you're, how you're doing on each of your pieces of the domain. And so some processes may have an extra one. So that would be an example of when they might need to send a longer message than others. Um, and so there is an MPI gather V and the V stands for variable. And that allows a varying data count from each process. Okay. And it's, it's kind of it's kind of a big thing. It's very similar to what we already saw. So you have a send buffer. You have a count of how many that you personally are sending. 
Um, and then there's this, um, you know, the send type, and then there's a receive, receiving buffer, and then there's this receive counts. And what that is, is that's an array of the lengths of each of the messages that you're expecting to receive. Okay. And um, this displacement is, um, uh, it's an array also that specifies the uh, displacement relative to the beginning of the buffer at which the data needs to be placed. Okay. So it's a little bit tricky, um, but it's definitely a very doable thing if you have a variable sized message that you need to be sending to a central location. Okay, so then we have scatter. So let's say that uh, I'm a manager process and I want to send um, identical, very similar but different messages to uh, all of the other processes. So I could send, you know, n separate messages. Um, instead, I can send one message that just gets split apart and goes to the right uh, process. So that is what scatter is. You can kind of picture that, right? That scatter. So um, it's kind of like a, I guess, like a, like a dandelion, you know, and you blow on it and they all get out. They're all similar, but not the same. Okay, that's scatter. So I have a send buffer where that's where I'm keeping, uh, you know, all of the data that I want to be sending. And then this count says how many of how many you know how much of a chunk how how big is a chunk how many items in a chunk and this send type tells you what the data type is and then each of the processes that are getting sent something have to have a receive buffer defined uh, and then they know how much they're receiving and then this root thing is where am I receiving it from what pro what count is is sending this out what rank is sending it. And then, um, you know, the communicator. Now, like, like you have a gather and a gather V, you have a scatter and a scatter V. And the scatter V is the same idea. Uh, but again, you have, you have to have these two extra things. You have the send counts and you have this displacement that tells, you know, how many are being sent and where you should uh, start for uh, getting the, the chunk that is supposed to be sent to a particular process. All right, um, so then we've got something called reduce. So maybe we have to do the sum of many sub sum, sub sums owned by all processors. Hmm, where have we seen that before? Oh, that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Um, maybe we want to find the maximum value of a variable across all processors. So we want to find like, uh, okay, so we're computing our potential energy on this domain and we want to find like, how big is the error in that computation on each of our chunks? Um, and like, what's the biggest error and can we stop yet? Basically, a lot of these types of algorithms for, for computing potential energy or whatever are iterative where you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, and you keep getting closer and closer to the true solution. And eventually at some point you just say, look, that error is small enough, I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna give up. Well, not really give up, I'm gonna end. And that's my answer and it's close enough. Uh, so maybe we wanna find, you know, how far off are we? What's the biggest error that we have? Um, and so, you know, we wanna collect everybody's error information. And we want to find out, but we don't care what, what they all are. We just want to know what the biggest one is because there's a threshold. And once the biggest one is smaller than that, then we can stop iterating. Okay, so what you can do for these types of scenarios is you can perform what's called a global reduce, okay, across all the group members. So this is, uh, this is the form that it takes. It's called MPI reduce. And so each of the processes that is sending something has a send buffer where they're giving their information. And then there's this receive buffer that is um, only necessary to be defined by the root of the, uh, of, of the reduce. So the one who's gonna be receiving the information. Uh, this count thing is, you know, how many items that you're reducing over. 
Um, and then this data type thing is what kind of data type is that are those? Um, and then the operation, this is what this, this one stands for here, MPI op is the operation that you're reducing. So are you doing a sum? Are you doing a max? And I'll show you in the next slide what the different operations that you can do are. And then the root, so that's who's gonna be the person who receives all this information. I keep personifying all these processes. So who's gonna be the process that's receiving the information? And then of course, the communicator over which you are performing the reduction. So now with reduce, you can, these are some of the um, predefined operations that you can do. So, um, you know, you could do maximum, minimum, sum, product, logical and, bitwise and, logical or, bitwise or, logical XOR, bitwise XOR. And then um, these two, which is the maximum value and location or the minimum value and location. So that's like, if I want to know, okay, what is the, biggest error and which processor has it. So mm -hmm. if I wanted to know that information, then I could use this MPI max block. Okay. And then the, the allowed types, this just has to do with like, um, you can find a maximum integer or a maximum floating point, but you can't find a maximum character or something absurd like that. Okay. Um, so that's, that's how it works. Um, so with the, with these though, these are, there are these, two, these types are kind of specialized. So they have, uh, they return, you know, either the max and the min or the min, and along with the rank of the first process that uh, it encounters with that value. So you use these special MPI pair data types. So it could be MPI float int, so a, a floating point and an integer, it could be double int, so a double precision number and an integer. And of course the integer is the, uh, the rank. Um, it could be a long and an integer. It could be two integers, right? So those are special predefined MPI pair data type arguments that you could use with this. Um, and if you're really interested, I encourage you to read the MPI standard. Uh, you can also define your own operations, your own reduction operation. Um, and you can use this thing called MPI op create to create new operations, but uh, I'm not really gonna tell you how to do that. So you just look at the MPI standard and you can learn about how that works. Okay, so we've talked about these other operations and in all of those, the final answer goes to one processor. Um, but what if we want all of the processors to know the results of the scatter or gather or reduce. Uh, so we have these these that are uh, these operations that are prefixed with the word all. So we have MPI all gather, and that's the same as a gather, except for the answer ends up on all of the processes instead of just the root. Um, and all gather V, of course. And then we've got uh, all to all which is a scatter gather algorithm, okay? And this one can make your brain hurt, but it, it's actually pretty frequently in, uh, you find it pretty frequently in, for example, astrophysics codes. So let's say that you are trying to calculate, um, you know, a, a universe simulation. So in your universe, you divide it up into pieces and you put those pieces on all the different processors. And each of those pieces, they have like galaxies and things like that in them, right? And because gravity, you know, gravity operates infinitely across everything. So um, all of the different uh, parts of, of your universe there, pieces of universe, are going to be impacted by the gravity caused by all of the other pieces of your universe. So in that situation, what you wanna do is you wanna actually, everybody wants to send their information about the gravity in their particular piece to all of the other pieces. And everyone in the other pieces wants to receive information from all of the other pieces too. So if you can kind of picture that in your brain, 
that is what an all to all does. So every process sends a message to every other process. And they also receive a message from every other process. Okay, and that's, that's the all to all. Um, and so there's a send buffer in which you would send your information and then this send count and what kind of data that you're sending. And then you have your own receive buffer where you're receiving from all of your other neighbors. And um, there's also an all to all V if you want to get really confusing, you can send variable sized messages to all of your, all of everyone in the whole communicator, basically, and receive variable sized messages from all of everyone in the whole communicator. Okay. Now you could send individual messages. Um, you'd have to keep track of it all. Um, and so that's where this um, all to all really comes in handy is that it'll keep track of all of the messages that are being sent. And it'll also send and receive them more efficiently than if you were just doing individual sends and receives. Okay, so then there's also an all reduce. It's the same as a reduce, except that uh, the result of the reduction appears on all processes. So has the same format, um, it kind of leaves out the root. That's the only difference here in this, in this function call. Okay, so then there's a function called barrier. And sometimes maybe in your algorithm, you might need to try to synchronize your processes. So, uh, you know, maybe if one has a lot less work to do than all the others, um, it just kind of needs to hold its horses, so to speak, and just wait until the other ones get caught up. Uh, and so that's what a barrier will do. A barrier will block until all group members have called it. So um, it just has to do with the communicator. So it, everyone in the communicator, once they have called MPI barrier, then you can move along. Now, um, MPI barrier can be particularly handy um, when you're trying to debug your MPI code, when there's something wrong that's happening. Um, it kind of helps you to figure out where that might be. Um, but generally, I would say if you are using a barrier in a production code, that that is probably not the best practice. If there's a way that you can um, change your algorithm or something to get around using a barrier, I would recommend it. Because um, usually a barrier kind of indicates that there's a bit of a problem um, with the parallelism or the sequential sequentiality of your code. All right. Um, so that is everything for MPI. So I'm going to take some questions. So I've got a lot of uh, bibliography things here. If you all are interested in more information about MPI and MPI collectives. So the uh, MPI, there's an MPI book and you could buy it, or you could just look at it online for free. So that's what I tend to do. Um, MPitch has an extensive documentation. Um, that MPitch, like I said, is a is a uh, open source version of MPI. That's a good one. Uh, and then the MPI standard, you can always look at that. Um, there's a really good MPI tutorial on uh, the Livermore website, Lawrence Livermore. So I encourage you to check that one out too. Uh, and then you can read the MPI standard. Um, and I don't have the MPI 4 up here, but I should have added it. All right, so that's everything there. So anybody have any questions? I mean, you might even have questions left over from before lunch. Let's see now. Will we need the code? Okay, good question. Will we need the code from the first exercise? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry about the short note, uh, short short lunch. Um, we you don't really need it. I mean, I'm going to use it, I guess, when I write the second code, but uh, you don't really need it. No. Okay. So then, how do we access the darts dish MPI at C? Um, okay, so let me let me explain here what I did. So here's my directory. Okay, 
I mean, this directory, this is the, this, this developing, developing with MPI and OpenMP, that is the directory that I got from doing that uh, Git clone, okay? And within that, there was these, okay, if I do an LS minus L, you can probably see this better. So uh, within that, there is this darts suite. See, if, it's, if something has this D right here, that means it's a directory. So there's this directory called Dart suite. Um, within that directory, there are two directories called C and Fortran. So I'm assuming you like C, and uh, if you don't, then um, you can do Fortran, of course. But if you do ls dart suite slash C, then you can see all in here. So um, darts.c, that's the original um, file that was the serial file that I said, copy that one and use it. Okay, all the rest of these, darts dash whatever.c, all of those are um, answers effectively. Okay, so you can look at those and you can see them. Now, just because I'm saying those are answers, it doesn't mean that they're the only answers or the only right way to do it. There are a lot of different ways that you can do it. It's just ways that I did it that one time when I was writing this, okay? Um, so I, I write it differently every time. So if you compare that to what I wrote today, it's different, I promise you, it's, it's quite a bit different. Okay, so let's see, we've got some other questions. Um, okay, then how do I open these files is what somebody else asked me. Um, so I use a, a, I use something called VR, okay, which is a, um, it's just an editor, it's a text editor. Um, there's, an, uh, there's another one called Emacs, and those are primarily the two editors that probably people who work on supercomputers use the most. Um, there's another editor called Nano that you should be able to use and it's a lot easier than either of those. So VI is kind of complicated. It's, it's not, it's, it's, um, it has these two modes. So it has this, this text entry mode and then it has this command mode. And that, that can be kind of confusing to people. So that's why I wouldn't, I wouldn't just say, oh, just use VI. Okay, um, Emacs is a little bit simpler in the sense that it doesn't have uh, two different modes to it. But um, Emacs kind of requires you to, um, I, I guess my main criticism of Emacs is I don't actually have enough fingers to do all of the, the commands that you have to do while simultaneously pushing buttons. You have to remember what, all they, what they are. So that one can be kind of tricky. Uh, so I would, so I would just recommend using Nano if you're not familiar with any type of of um, a, a text editor. Then I would just use Nano. Okay. okay. Can give the s out command. Okay. I think somebody put the s out command. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Can you show how to properly compile and run? The compile code. Okay. I was able to allocate, but I can't S run it. Okay. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll just do, I'll just create the uh, collective and then, um, and, and then I'll, I'll S alloc for myself there. And then um, that'll show you how to do it. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, if you look here, I have this um, darts-mpi.c that I made. I'm just going to copy that one. Um, darts-collective. Because I didn't really explain, I guess, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going back and forth here. Um, our next assignment is going to be doing the same thing. Uh, we are just going to use collectives. So previously we used the six basic MPI routines. And so now instead of using send and receive, we're going to use something from the collectives instead of send and receive. Okay. 
So it's going to be basically the same code. We are just going to um, change the collective that we use. So you might consider if you want to, you could take, um, if you didn't, if you, if your dart stash mpi.c doesn't work, um, that's okay, that's no big deal. But what you can do is you can copy from this dart suite slash C, okay? You can copy this um, darts MPI. Oh, that's exciting. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, you can copy this darts MPI to your directory and that was very exciting. Sorry about that. And, and you can um, use that. You can take that one and just change it to use um, collectives instead. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So uh, let me, oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I'm the person that wrote that last question. I, I tried to use the darts dash MPI, like the one that's supposed to be already correct. And like, I try, I, I think I compiled it with CC, but um, it, it like so it gives like a run and like or a run error and it like collapses. Um, so I, I, I was that's why I asked that question. That's very exciting. That's very exciting. Um, well, let me see. Let me see it. So um, I'll just look at it quickly and see if there's anything weird that I see. No, I mean that one. That one should work. It looks okay. So um, there could be something strange that you that you did in your environment. So my suggestion is my suggestion is to um, just have a very clean environment. So. Um, a lot of people customize their uh, and their environments on the supercomputer. I do not because I know because I you know part of my job is helping users to run. Um, so I I always use a very clean default environment on the machine. I have a few little macros that I like, but that but they're not um, they're not anything that substantially changes the environment. They're just um, abbreviations. Okay. So like I do this thing called LSH. I, I made that, it's just a little handy thing. And then that shows me, that's LS minus LT head, <laughs> pipe head, um, which you don't know what that necessarily means, but it just means I, I'm looking at all the latest files and, and their dates and, and all of the information about them, okay? Okay, but other than that, my environment is the default user environment and I have not loaded any modules at all and I've not changed anything. So if you like, especially if you have a, a, a training account or if you have a very new account, um, you should just be able to run everything without, uh, without loading any modules or making any changes whatsoever. It should all just work. Okay? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and if you think you've gotten yourself into a pickle, um, my suggestion would be to just log out and log back in because that'll just refresh everything anew and you shouldn't have to change anything. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Oh, somebody was trying to run through Jupyter Notebook kernels. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, no, you probably do just need to SSH instead of doing something fancy like Jupyter Notebooks. Sorry. This is just like, this is like old school here, y'all. Old school computers. Okay, so just do an SSH. Um, if you're on a Mac, which I think a lot of you are, uh, you should just be able to pull up a shell, a terminal window, and you should just be able to use that to do SSH and, um, and log into the, uh, the login node on Cori. Okay, so let's look at this darts collective, which is really just uh, darts MPI at this moment. And let's see, what do we need to do? So first of all, uh, what MPI command, collective command can we use 
instead of these receives and sends. So you remember, we had our thing, we did our, we did our, um, we did our trials, right? We did, we did all this. Uh, and so we have, we have whatever we personally um, get for the number of, uh, the, the number of darts that were thrown inside of the circle. And then we had, um, if our rank is zero, so if, if we're the manager, then we have to receive from everyone else, add it all up and figure out what, uh, and, and then, you know, compute pi and print it out. Whereas if we are the, um, the non-manager, we're just one of the workers, then we just send our information to the manager and then we're done. Okay, so what collective could we use instead of this receive and send business? Okay, I think I'm guessing some people have already figured this out. Okay, okay, yeah, we could do gather, but, uh, but reduce, that's the one we wanna do, right? Reduce will take everything. So let's go back to here. Let's look at reduce, reduce. Reduce, it'll perform a global reduction across all group members. So this is, this is the one that we wanna use. And because look, there's a there's a reduction here. This is a list of all of our reductions that are predefined called MPI sum, right? And that's what we're doing. We're just taking the sum, right? So that's gonna make our lives like super duper easy. So what we wanna do is, okay. So if, so everyone has to participate in the reduction, right? Everyone participates. The question then is, um, for this reduction, who, okay, we know that this operation here, that's gonna be um, the sum, right? That's gonna be MPI sum for that. Who's gonna be our root? Okay, what file name is this? In this case, I'm in my file that I made and it was called um, MPI. It was, it was um, yeah, darts-mpi, but I copied it into a new file called darts. Um, um, what did I call it? Oh, my little brain. Uh, darts Collective, thank you. All right, and I thought I heard somebody trying to answer my question before I rudely interrupted them. Root is zero. Yes, rank of manager. Good, that's what we want. Okay, so everybody is going to, so look, there's not this, nobody's sending anything, right? There's not this, we don't need this else at all because nobody's sending anything. And then if we're rank zero, the only unique thing that we have to do is compute pi and print it out, right? That's the only unique thing that rank zero is doing. So it's not doing this part right here. It's just computing pi. Okay, so now um, we're gonna have a new, a new variable called total. And we're gonna put that in here. So we're gonna do, um, everybody is doing an MPI reduce, right? And reduce operation we have first we have to have our send buffer so our send is we're sending n circ okay but actually we're not sending n circ we're sending the information that is in the that begins at the memory location that we call n circ okay so and it is of length one okay then um let me see if, oh no, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going the wrong order. So the next thing is the receive buffer. And so the receive buffer is total. And again, it's asking for what is the uh, location of it? It's not asking you uh, what the name of it is. It, it's wanting to know a memory address where it can just put all that stuff. Okay, then the next thing is the count. And so in this case, we're sending one piece of data, right? We're sending our sum. And then the data type is going to be MPI long. 
And then um, let, let me make sure I've got this. Okay, the operation is the next thing. So that's gonna be MPI sum. Then the root is gonna be zero. And then the communicator. Okay, let's see if I can remember that. So then uh, the, this is gonna be MPI sum. The root is gonna be zero. And then MPI com world. Okay. So did you see how much this simplified our code? Our code is so much simpler now. We just have one MPI command that we are going to do now. It's just this MPI reduce. Is it more efficient or is it just the code simplified? Both, both. So the code is simplified. And it makes it a whole lot easier for us to read this code. And then also it's going to be way more efficient because it's going to use this tree algorithm instead of sending and receiving in, um, individual messages. So I'm just going to write this while I'm paranoidly thinking about it. All right, so shall we try compiling it? See how we go? All right, so I'm gonna do that. So uh, CC is the name of the MPI enabled C compiler on Cori. That's all I have to do. CC darts collective. And then, oh, that's minus. Minus O means this is what I want it to call the executable. Okay, so I I did it. Okay, and it accepted my thing. Okay, that's really good. Now, um, if you forget what your what command that you've ever done, you can do this thing called history, and it tells you all the commands that you've ever done. Okay, and if you want to know, okay, I know it. I know it has this in it, this particular thing in it. So in this case, I want to remember what my s alloc command was because I forgot. So pipe means take the output of this and make it the input to the next command. Rep is something where it'll look for something in a regular expression. And the thing that I want to look for is s alloc. I remember I had this great s alloc command. I just forgot what it was. Okay, so this is how I do that. Oh, look at that! This was it. Uh, this was my. This is what I did right here. Okay, I really like that command. So now what I could do is. This is the last s out command that I did. Okay, so there are a couple of ways I can get back to this command and do this command. So first thing is I can do this exclamation point. Okay, we we'll call it bang. So bang s out, and it'll do the same s out command that I did the last time I ever did an s out, which happens to be this one, and that's what I want to do. Okay, another way I could get it is I could do bang again, and then this number right here, 1016. That was the number in the list of my history of all the things that I ever did that was an S alloc and I really liked it, okay? So in this case, this bang S alloc, because I can do that because this, this command started with S alloc. So in my history, I have another command that has an S alloc, but it doesn't start with S alloc. So that's why this bang S alloc is gonna pick up this command number 1016 right here, okay? So I'm gonna do that. And look, it picked it up. It remembered my command. This is so terrific for those of us who have like a pea brain when we're trying to remember these sorts of, you know, specific details of, well, what did I do last time? I don't remember. All right, so I've got my node, my node actually. And then I'm gonna do um, an S run. <coughs> and if I don't remember my S run command that I did last time, I just do it like that. Again, I can do, Count of, sorry, bang, S run. And oh yeah, last time I did 68 of them. That was interesting. Now that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do because I actually want to do darts collective. 
but you get the point. And the way I got that command up again so fast is I just pushed the up arrow. Okay, so I'm getting, looks like I'm getting the identical wrong answer. So what that says is that um, by, uh, by changing to the collective operation, I didn't screw it up. Okay, I didn't, I didn't mess up anything more than was already messed up. Okay. Uh, anybody have any questions before we move on? We gotta move on to um, OpenMP so that we can learn about that. That one's pretty cool. Uh, okay, yeah. Seems slower. It may be slower. Um, yeah, I don't know. We could time it. So we could go like this. Um, we can type time in front of it. We can time it. How long did it take? Oh, now it's taking a really long time. All right. And then we can time nice FBI. Oh man, it did take less time. Interesting. Uh, it could be a fluke. It could be that uh, the MPI collective doesn't really help you on such a low number of, of MPI processes. It could be um, also because it's all within a node that it doesn't really matter. I don't know. Oh yeah, how did I jump immediately to the beginning of the plan? Control A, that's right. Control A is, is uh, to the beginning of it. Control E is to the end of it. Okay, Bryce, rub it in. Those are Emacs commands. <laughs> You're right. But those only require two fingers, whereas some Emacs commands require a lot. It's like playing Twister with your fingers. It doesn't work for me. Okay. Awesome, everybody. Okay, so let's go on to Open MP and hybrid programming. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about Open MP and um, some Open MP directives, and we'll learn about, a bit about data scope, uh, runtime library routines. Um, and environment variables um, using OpenMP. And then at the end, we'll talk about hybrid programming. You may run out of time to do the exercise for that. Okay, so OpenMP. So OpenMP is, it's kind of like uh, MPI in that it's a standard. So it's an industry standard for shared programming. Um, it was developed first in 1997 and there's an OpenMP ARB. And what they do is they determine the additions and updates to the standard. So the current standard is 5.1 uh, in November 2020. It was fi uh, finally released. Uh, and the standard includes uh, GPU offloading, which has been available since 4.5. But we're not going to talk about GPU offloading today. OK, so some the, these are some cool things about OpenMP. So you can take your code, and you can parallelize just small parts of it one at a time beginning with the parts that take up the most time. Um, you can use OpenMP for simple or complex algorithms. Your code size actually grows only very modestly. And uh, it, it's, it, the expression, the way that it expresses parallelism, it, it flows within your code very clearly. So it's really easy to read it and to understand what's happening in your code. And then also you can use a single source code for OpenMP and non-OpenMP. Um, so if you don't want to use OpenMP, um, you can just get your compiler. You can either use a non-OpenMP compiler and it will ignore the OpenMP directives, or you can instruct your compiler to ignore the OpenMP directives. So those are things that I really like about OpenMP. So the API of OpenMP is a combination of directives, which we'll learn about, um, runtime library routines and environment variables. And so there's kind of three categories of things um, that, that are in the API. Um, so expression of parallelism, like a flow, flow control sort of things, uh, data sharing among threads. So 
kind of a communication side to it. And then a synchronization, so coordination or interaction between threads. So the parallelism of OpenMP is it's a shared memory thread-based parallelism. So this is something that you would do within a node on a like a node on Cori, but you wouldn't, you can't use it across nodes. So it's an explicit parallel regions model. So you'll have a master thread and it'll just be, you know, going along doing its thing. And then you'll fork these OpenMP threads and they'll do all their things. And then you will rejoin back to a single thread and then re-fork at a later time if you want and do parallel things and then join back up into a single thread. Uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the fork and join model that it follows. Okay, so it has, uh, it uses these things called directives. Um, and of course, what kind of a nerd would I be if I didn't have something about the prime directive here, right? Okay, got my nerd card. Cool. Okay, so we'll talk about, uh, we'll do like a syntax overview. Okay, and I see a question, does OpenMP complement or replace CUDA programming? Um, it replaces it, I would say. Um, well, it's a long and complicated thing, but um, I, um, but it's it's kind of a replacement if you're if you're using the offload parts, and then it would be a complement if you're just only using OpenMP on your CPU. Okay, so the basic format is a uh, pragma. Uh, I should say a pound sign or hash, whatever you want to call that. Pragma, OMP, and then the name of the directive, and then if there's a clause or something and then a new line character. So all of your directives have to end in a new line character. It uses the pragma construct. So, so if, you, if you program in C or C++ uh, already, you may have seen pragmas before for other things. Um, and pragma is just a Greek word that means thing done. So the pragmas are case sensitive and the directives follow the standard rules for C or C++ compiler directives. Um, and so if you need to use curly braces, you have to use them on the next line because uh, to, to denote the scope of the directive. And you do use curly braces to denote the scope sometimes for certain uh, directives. Um, and then long directive lines, if you have a really long line, you can you, you can do a continuation with an escaping new line. So that's just, you put a backslash and then you hit enter and then you go on to the next line and that's part of the pragma, okay? So if you're a Fortran person, um, Fortran, it's a similar format. Um, it's a, There's a sentinel, a directive name, and then any extra clauses or whatever. And so there's three accepted sentinels which um, if, you, if you know Fortran, you know that the uh, exclamation point, the star and the C are all uh, comment symbols. So um, if you have, a, if you have a, a Fortran compiler that doesn't recognize OpenMP, it will just ignore these because it thinks they're comments, okay? Um, and so you need to have one of these sentinels and then the name of the directive. And if you're a fixed form Fortran person, um, then they have to begin at column one. Um, and then the directive has to have a space or a zero in column six, and then you move on from there. If you're doing free form code, uh, which I hope you're doing in not Fortran 77, um, then the only acceptable sentinel is this exclamation dollar sign OMP. And you can put it in any column, but it has to be the first thing in the column. And then it has to ha be followed by a space. And if you wanna do a continuation, you put an ampersand on that line, and then the following line also begins with the sentinel, and then you go about whatever else you're updating, um, adding to that directive, okay? And then of course, you still have all of the standard rules for freeform line length and spacing and things like that. Okay, so the first directive that, this is kind of like the hello world type of directive, so it's called parallel. And so it's just a block of code 
that is going to be executed by multiple threads. So the syntax here is just pound pragma OMP parallel. And then uh, for your parallel section, you just surround it with curly braces. Um, and then these things that are in dark blue that are kind of not, um, not bold, those are optional additions. And we'll talk about what those mean later. Um, and so there's a similar format for the, uh, for the Fortran. The difference is that you have OMP parallel and then you have OMP end parallel for Fortran because it doesn't use the curly braces to denote scope. Okay. So here's a simple example. So this is a hello world example. Uh, and so you have, you know, you set up, you have to pound include OMP.h. And then you have um, the, oh, I'm sorry. I just accidentally clicked. Oh, that's awesome. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so then you have your pragma OMP parallel um, and private. And, and we'll, again, we'll talk about what all these mean, but basically you're getting the thread number. So this is the same as like getting your MPI rank. Okay. And then you're printing out your thread numbers. So it says, hello world from threads. And then it's gonna print out thread numbers. And then it's gonna say, I am sequential now, okay? And so here's the identical thing in Fortran if you're, if you're a Fortran fan. Okay, so here's the thing. When you run it, you would expect it might say, it might be like this. Hello world from threads, zero, one, two, three, four. I am sequential now, but you could also get Hello world from threads one, two, zero, four, three. I am sequential now. Because the order of execution of the threads is scheduled by the operating system, okay? So the operating system decides when, when your threads get executed. And so they have to be parallel. They have to be not at all dependent upon the order in which, uh, in which they're being executed. Otherwise, you'll run into some terrible problems. And, and OpenMP can be really insidious with these types of problems. Okay, so the probably the number one thing that people do in OpenMP is they do loops. So, the, so um, in this, there's a there's a loop uh, directive. So um, the the syntax of this is pragma OMP four. Okay, because you know, like in in uh, in C. Or C++, it goes for i equals whatever, right? So that's why it's called for. So you just you just add this pragma around your for loop, okay? And then there's these options, and we are going to talk about what those mean shortly. Um, so you have a similar thing in Fortran, except it's called do because in Fortran a for loop is a do loop. Okay, now you can see on this and you could see in the previous one, we've got this thing about schedule and type and, and then private and shared, we won't talk about yet, and no wait. Okay, so the type can be static, dynamic, guided, or runtime. And then if you specify no wait, uh, the threads won't synchronize at the end of the loop. So normally the threads would just hang out and wait until the end of the loop. Um, but if you put no wait, they're just gonna keep going on after the loop is over. Okay, so now the loop scheduling, the default scheduling is determined, it's implementation specific, um, but here are kind of what these mean. So static means that the ID of the thread that's performing a particular iteration is a function of the iteration number and the number of threads. So if last time, if you have, you know, the same number of threads and the same size loop, if if uh, thread five performed this iteration last time, thread five is going to perform that iteration this time too. So it these are statically assigned at the beginning of the loop, and this is really good if you have a predictable amount of work per iteration. But it's not so good if the work varies per iteration because um, you know you could have you could experience some load imbalance. Um, so as an alternative, to that is is dynamic scheduling. And so in this case, the assignment of the threads is determined at runtime. So it's a round robin thing. So you get some work and then you get some work. And then when you're done with your work, you come back and you get more work. And so your thread could, could be a different, different thread number that completes a particular uh, iteration of the loop. 
Um, but this enables you to have some load balancing. However, there is a little bit of extra overhead involved in, in doing this kind of dynamic scheduling. So this is a little bit of a confusing um, table, but the idea here is that um, if you have static uh, scheduling, you have you know, really low overhead. If you have dynamic scheduling, you have much higher overhead. And then there's also these things called chunks. And so you can tell OpenMP um, like how many iterations of the loop you want to assign at once. So in, uh, in this case, you, uh, so you say, I wanna have this chunk size of C, okay? And then um, it'll, it'll divide up the work accordingly. It'll give everybody uh, C pieces of work to do. Well, actually, and by by C or something like that, but it'll give it'll give them each C pieces of work per chunk. Um, and so, uh, so you can use both the uh, scheduling, the type of scheduling, static, dynamic, whatever, and also the chunk size to kind of tweak the performance of your loop. Um, and you the one way that you can do that is at runtime. There are these environment variables that um, that you can use and you can tell it to do static or to do dynamic and to do chunk sizes of various types. So that's, that's <laughs> excuse me, that's how that works. Okay, so then the next question, the next obvious question here is what kind of loops are parallelizable? Uh, so, I mean, that's a legit question. There are some loops that you cannot parallelize with OpenMP. Okay, so in order for a loop to be parallelizable, the following has to be true. The number of iterations has to be known upon entry and it cannot change. So a lot of times you might have an iterative loop where, uh, you know, like I was talking about before, where you have, um, you have a threshold of error. And once you get below that threshold, then you can quit, okay? Well, that kind of loop, you don't know ahead of time if you're gonna do you know, five iterations or 5,000. So you could not parallelize that with OpenMP because OpenMP has to know. It, it has to be computable upon entering the loop, okay? It doesn't, doesn't have to be a constant, but it, has to, but it has to be computable. It has to know ahead of time, okay? Um, each iteration of your loop has to be independent of all of the others. So you can't, you can't have the case where um, the iterations depend upon each other because, because then they're not parallelizable, right? Those are sequential iterations. They can't be, uh, they, they can't be parallelized, and and likewise, there has to be no data dependence. So I can't, I can't be dependent upon some data that got, uh, that got calculated in a previous iteration, in this current iteration. Okay, so uh, the things that are not parallelizable is uh, are conditional loops, like I was saying about the like the iterative loops, and those are very common if. It, if it's like a while loop instead of a for loop. Um, and then iterators, it, it can't parallelize those yet. Um, I think maybe it can in, in uh, OpenMP5, but not in earlier versions. Um, and then of course, if, if your iterations depend upon each other or have any data dependence. So a good trick that I learned was if you can run a loop backwards and still get the same results, chances are it's parallelizable. That's a, that's a trick that I learned. It's, it, it's kind of an easy test. Okay, another question. What's the relation among the number of threads in OpenMP, number of processes in a node, and number of cores in a node? Okay, so um, the idea there is you wanna have a number of threads of OpenMP times the number of MPI processes, and you want that to equal the number of cores in the node or a multiple of the number of cores in the node. Like sometimes um, cores that you could actually, um, you could actually do kind of over subscription and you can get slightly better performance. Yeah, all right, cool. All right, so we're gonna talk about Gaussian elimination. Does anybody know what Gaussian elimination is? Actually, probably lots of people don't remember what Gaussian elimination is. So the idea of Gaussian elimination is you're trying to solve a linear system of equations. So um, probably, you know, in high school or something, you, you learned this. So you've got like 
3x plus 2y minus 5z equals 7. And then you've got another equation like, I don't know, 12x minus 5y plus z equals 84. And then you've got a third equation with x, y, and z. x plus y plus z equals 8. I don't know. OK, so you want to solve that. Now, if you remember in school, one way to solve that is you take one of the equations and you solve for x, let's say. And then, uh, so then you get a function of y and z, right? So like that, that what I had was like x plus y plus z equals 8, OK? So um, x equals 8 minus y minus z, OK? And then I can just substitute that into one of the first two equations, actually into both of the first two equations, so that then I just have a system of two equations and two unknowns. So now it's just a system of equations of, of, uh, of y and z, OK? And then likewise, I can take those, OK? Um, and I can solve one of them for y, and then I can substitute that in, and then I have a system. Uh, actually, I just have an equation for z, and then I solve for z, right? And then I go back, and I, I go back to that y and z uh, equation that I had, and I plug in z, and I get y, and then I go back to the original x plus y plus z equation. I plug in x, or I'm sorry, I plug in y, and I plug in z, which I've already found the values of, and I can get x, okay? I don't know if you remember that from a math class, but that's exactly what Gaussian elimination is. The difference is Gaussian elimination is in the form of matrices instead of x plus y plus z sort of thing. It's more like just, um, just like an array, like a 1D array of, of variables, and then a matrix is like a, a 2D array, okay? So, uh, this is exactly what you're doing here. So in this, so you're iterating through, and then you're solving. Uh, you're solving the equation. Okay. Um, so here's kind of a graphical example. So this is the i loop in that. So that was a triple loop. You saw it had i j, i j and k. Yes, triple loop. Um, and so. What you're doing in the first step is you're eliminating the first variable from here. You're, you're trying to get zeros here. Okay, so zero x and then y and z, right? Um, so, you, so you do that by taking a multiple of this equation here and subtracting it from all of these other equations, okay? Because that's effectively what we did in the other thing that I was telling you about. Okay. Uh, and so then once we're done with these, we, we've finished with these. Next, we do it recursively, right? We're doing it to the second row and column. So we're taking this second row and we are taking multiples of it and subtracting it from these other ones so that we can make zeros in these columns, so that we can eliminate that variable. Okay, and we keep on going until eventually we get down to where we just have one unknown and then we can solve it. Okay, that's how Gaussian elimination works. So the question is, is this parallelizable? And if so, where? So can we parallelize the outermost loop? Okay, so the question is, can we do this? Um, well, it has a constant number of iterations. It has, so if we're doing an n by n matrix, there's n minus one iterations that we have to do there. Uh, and, but unfortunately, those iterations depend upon each other, right? Because first I have to eliminate everything in the first column before I can do start eliminating things from the second column. So unfortunately, those iterations depend upon each other. Um, because the values that we computed in the previous iteration have to be used in the next iteration. So, so that loop is not parallelizable. Okay, now how about the inner loop, the J loop? So in that case, what we're doing in the inner loop is we're subtracting multiples of that uh, top row from all of the rows below it. Now, does it matter if I subtract first from the second row or from the nth row or from the 57th row, it doesn't matter, right? I'm still gonna get the same answer because in that step, what I'm doing to that 
to those rows is independent of each other, right? I could run that backwards and I would still get the same answer during that step, okay? So that inner loop, it has a constant number of iterations. So what I was saying before, you have to be able to compute the number of iterations. So it has N minus I iterations. Although at each step, N minus I is different, at each step of I, N minus I is a different value, but it is a constant for a given I. So I can pre-compute how many I need to do. So, and those iterations can be performed in any order. So the, that inner loop J is parallelizable, okay? Now, similarly, the, the, the K loop, what the K loop does, let me go back to my picture to show you what it does again. Oh, okay. The K loop is, uh, I'm, I'm subtracting, I'm so, let's do this one because it's easiest to see. I'm subtracting these elements from these elements, okay? And K is varying across here, okay? So does it matter if I subtract from this one last versus subtracting from this one? Doesn't matter, right? I can do those subtractions in any order, okay? So, um, so that's the way that I'm gonna do it, okay? I'm going to, um, I, I can, I can, um, you know, again, we have a constant number of iterations here. Um, those iterations can be performed in any order. So these two, I can parallelize these, either of these two loops, okay? I could parallelize both if I'm super ambitious um, because you can spawn threads and then you can spawn more threads. But it's probably smartest to just do one or the other. It's just a little easier. It doesn't make your brain hurt as much. It's much clearer what happens. Okay, so here's my new code, y'all. Okay, so you recall my other code? Uh, I put in green here, I put the entire difference between that code and this code. So um, I just added one line to my code and now it is parallel. Isn't that great? I added one line to my code and now it's parallel. Pretty cool, huh? Now you may be asking, why did you do the J loop and not the, not the K loop? Because you could do either one. You said you could do either one. Yes, I could. Um, but I decided to do the J loop because um, what happens is whenever you do this, um, there's a little bit of overhead when you create your, um, when you create your threads, there's some overhead involved. So um, this way I'm only doing this overhead, you know, n times basically, um, instead of doing it like kind of n squared over two times, if I were, you know, gonna put this, put the line here instead of out here. So that's why I, that's why I chose to do the outermost loop. And that's generally best practice for that. So All the, right. the, the parallelization, the problem doesn't, doesn't go into the inner loop. It, it only affects the outer loop. Um, yes. So, so the threads are going to be assigned work from the outer loop. Um, and then of course, each thread is going to then execute this inner loop as well. But, but yes, thread by thread, they just get work from the outer loop. Okay. Yeah, that was a really good question. Thanks for, thanks for asking. So the best practice here is if you have multiple loops, um, inner, outer, that are parallelizable and you're parallelizing just one of them to do the outer of those? Yes, yes, exactly right. That is the best practice because, um, because then you have the least overhead because it, it, there is overhead for um, creating and destroying the threads. So in this case, you know, I'm only creating them n times basically here, okay? Because I'm just doing it once for every iteration of this I loop. Um, if I did it in here, then I would be doing it, um, you know, once for every I loop times all of these Js. And so that it adds up to about n squared over two, you know, roughly, give or take. 
So, um, so I'm going to say, both? I'm sorry. Did you paralyze both the outer and the inner? You could. So the own, the system will handle that, okay? Yeah, but then you're still going to have a lot of overhead. Sure. Okay, because because every time this happens, so then you've got n creations of, of loops, right? And then you've got uh, you know n over two of them in here. So, um, so you're going to have a lot of overhead if you do it that way. Um, but there are cases, you know, not simple things like this, right? But there are cases where it could be a good idea to do that. Okay, just not this case. Okay, so um, the next thing we're going to talk about is synchronization. So sometimes you just want to make sure that your threads uh, execute a region of code in a proper order. So it could be that one part depends on another part being completed. Um, it could also be that only one thread needs to execute a section of the code. Um, it could, you know, so a lot of times IO is one of those things where um, you have to kind of be careful and only let one thread do it. Um, and so there are these synchronization directives that we're going to talk about. So there's critical and barrier and single. Okay. Um, so critical, what it does is it specifies a section of code that must be executed by only one thread at a time. Um, so you, you just create this and it creates like this critical region. And you, you should probably give it a name because if you have more than one critical section, um, the names are global identifiers. So critical regions with the same name are treated as the same region. So if they have no name, then they're all the same region. Um, so anyway, this, this would be for something that you only want one thread at a time doing it. Like you want all the threads to do it. It's just only one at a time can be doing it. Okay, um, and then single is similar, but you want only one thread period to do it. So it's, it's pretty useful for things that are kind of thread unsafe, like IO tends to be a bit thread unsafe. Um, and so, this is just what the syntax is. You just have this pragma OMP single, and then you have you know the curly braces around what is uh, what is this single area. Okay, and then we've got barrier. So the barrier it synchronizes all threads. So this is just like MPI barrier except for for threads. Um, and so all your threads have to reach this barrier, and once they do, then they get to move on. Um, and they, but in the meantime, they got to wait for their buddies until the until they're finished. Okay, um, and it's just a single line thing. And you can have code. Okay, so you can have code that kind of branches, and you have different threads doing different things, and then you can have these barriers in there. But the sequence of work sharing and barrier regions that your threads encounter have to be the same for all of the threads. Okay, so then um, reduction is another one. So, um, gee, where have we heard about reductions before, right? There's MPI reduce, but there's an open MP reduce. And of course, this is what we would use in our code for uh, the next part, which is very predictable that we would do, which would be to write this in open MP. So, um, so there's this pragma OMP reduction. And so then there's the operator, whatever operation you're gonna do. And then there's the list of the different variables that you wanna do it upon. So you could do it on X, Y, Z, you know, you could do it on all of it, uh, a bunch of variables at once. Um, but, you know, of course, for our case, we're gonna do it on the number of, of uh, the number of darts that land in the circle, right? So the, the, the operator, can be, um, you know, it takes these the, the following forms. So in, in C or C++, it, you know, just the, the plus sign, that's going to be what we're going to use. Um, you could subtract them all, multiply, you know, you can do anything, max or min. So this is just like MPI uh, reduce, except for its OMP reduction. <laughs> but it's basically the same concept that we learned before. No division. Yeah, I don't know why they don't have division. <laughs> I don't know exactly how you would do it. 
I guess. All right. Um, okay, so we've kind of, we've, we've done our um, directives. So if there's any questions about directives, I'll take those now. Um, and then we can, okay, I don't see any new things here. Let's see if we've got some new, then why subtraction? I, I guess subtraction is more controllable. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I honestly, I don't know why they don't have division, but I would think you could just do, you could just make a variable that's one over your variable and then use multiplication for division, right? It would still work. Okay, so let's talk about variable scope. Um, so we have uh, we have something that is a lot different in OpenMP than anything we had to worry about in um, in uh, MPI because uh, you know in MPI we didn't have memory that was being shared, and in OpenMP we do. So we're going to talk about variable scope and scoping clauses, and we're going to talk about common mistakes that people might make in this area. So um, within a parallel region, you can make variables be shared or private, okay? And what shared means is that you have one copy of the variable and it's shared between all the threads. So they all have access to that piece of memory. A private variable means that each thread at the beginning of, of the uh, parallel region, they make their own copy of the variable and that private variable exists only within this parallel region. Okay, so by default, all variables are gonna be shared, okay, except with a few exceptions. So index values in a parallel region loop, so the, so the loop index is gonna be private by default. Uh, local variables and uh, value parameters within the subroutines that are called within a parallel region, those are also private. And then variables that are de declared within the parallel region are also private. So variable scope is the most common source of errors in OpenMP codes. And, and this, is, this can be a really insidious error. So correctly determining variable scope is really important for correctness and for uh, improving the performance of your code. Right. And it can be super insidious, like 99 times your code works fine. And then that one time it just doesn't quite work and there's some problem. Okay, so um, the way that you scope them, okay, is you use these, these lists, basically. So you have shared and then the list of variables. So like when you start your parallel region, then, then um, you put shared and then you put a list of all of the things that you wanna be shared. Um, so shared, you wanna be really careful um, because you can get what's called a race condition where like, Sometimes you get the right answer and sometimes you get the wrong answer because, uh, because actually the, your algorithm, as it turns out, depends on the order in which the operations are, are performed. And so when that happens, then um, sometimes you get the right answer and sometimes you don't. Okay, uh, so then there's private. So similarly, you have private, and then you have a list of all the variables that are going to be private. Um, and a private variable is, uh, it exists only within a parallel region. Um, and so its value is actually undefined at the beginning, and then at the end, undefined. Now, you can have private variables that start with a defined value. Um, and so that is called first private. So it's similar to private, but it's called first private. And you, they initial, they're initialized to be the value that was held immediately before you entered into the parallel region, okay? And similarly, you can have a private that, a variable that ends with a defined value, and that's called last private. And at the end of the loop, it would set the variable to the value set by the final iteration of the loop. Okay, so here are some common mistakes that people make. So, this is number one, a, a, a variable that should be private is public. And then something is gonna unexpectedly get overwritten. Um, and so the solution to this is you must explicitly declare all variable scope. So you can, you, can, um, you can set it up in OpenMP so that 
forces you to do that. Um, another problem is called is non-deterministic execution. And that's where you get different results from different executions. And again, this is where the correctness of your result inadvertently uh, depends on the order that the parallel operations are performed. Okay, and that is the number one most insidious and annoying problem in OpenMP that can be really hard to track down. Okay, and then there's race condition. Okay, and that's what I was talking about before. Sometimes you get the wrong answer, uh, and the, the reasons probably are because you're overriding a shared variable, uh, and you just need to use a tool. If you can't figure it out yourself, there's these tools. One's called Cray Reveal. Another one is Parallel Where, Parallel Where Analyzer, and we have both of those tools at NERSC uh, to rescope rescope your loop. So it'll tell you how to correctly uh, scope your loop because because it's a smart um, tool and it'll figure it out for you. Okay, so remember our fun thing where I said we just did uh, one line? Well, I changed it around a little bit to make it um, have some problems. So can you tell me about the problems that we might have here? So we've got this, uh, we've got pragma. Okay, so first we, we declared i, j, and k up here, our um, loop. Um, indices and our double ratio, we declared it here too. And now we want um, pragma OMP parallel four. So we're gonna, so we did the right thing. We didn't, we didn't uh, parallelize this I loop, we're parallelizing this J loop. But uh, can anybody see some problems that we might run into here? Yes, okay, so a lot of, yeah, we've got this right. So the ratio, ratio is a shared variable, right? Because by default, everything is shared. So let's say I'm a thread and you're a thread. Uh, I overwrite the ratio to be five and you overwrite it to be six. And then I do my next computation with that ratio and I'm now I'm using six instead of five, right? So that would be a bad idea. Um, another thing is, okay, so I think this J will automatically, because it is the loop index for this parallel four, so it'll automatically be private, but this K is shared. So uh, yeah, so then we're gonna be overwriting each other about exactly where are we in, the, in this K loop, we're gonna be overwriting each other. So that'll be a problem. Okay. So this is the answer. <laughs> so J, K, and ratio are shared variables by default. Uh, depending on the compiler, the J may be optimized out and therefore not impacted, uh, but ratio will always lead to errors. So depending on how the loop is scheduled, you will see different answers. And that's not good. We wanna have the same answer every time, right? All right. Okay, so how do we fix it? Well, this is how we fix it, right? We make, we specify. So J, K, and ratio need to be private. And then A, B, and N can be shared. And then this is how you, this is how you make sure that you have scoped every variable. You, you put default none. What that does is it checks and it's like, oh, hey, you left out this variable. So you got to go scope it, you know, uh, you know, like that compile time, it'll give you an error. So that's how you can fix that problem. All right. Awesome. Yeah, just like what I said, the compiler will catch any variables that you didn't explicitly scope and it'll, it'll make you fix it. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk real quick about runtime library routines and environment variables um, because this is pretty quick. And then I'll answer more questions. So here's some library routines that you might want to use. So there's OMP set num of threads, and then you can set the number of threads explicitly to be used in the next parallel region. You have to call it from the serial part of your code. Okay. Um, and I rarely, if ever, use set num thread um, because I prefer, I would prefer for my for my code to be able to be more um, 
be less fixed, I guess, because that, that gives you like a fix, like you don't have a choice about the number of threads. Um, and then OMP get num threads, I use that a lot. Um, that's for how many threads there currently are. So, I mean, this is this is equivalent to MPI com size, right? It's, it's the same, but it's just for threads. And then OMP get thread num that returns the rank of the thread. So this is the same as uh, MPI com rank, right? And likewise, it goes from zero to the number of threads minus one. Uh, okay, then there's environment variables that you can use to control your execution. So you can set your the schedule, like I said before, you can set it at runtime. So in this case, I'm going to set it to dynamic, and I'm going to set the chunk size to be four. So there, you have to give up, give four iterations per unit of work. Uh, and then OMP num threads, and this sets the maximum number of threads, um, and so that. You also can do that at runtime, and that's um, that's much better. That that you know that allows a lot more flexibility in how your code runs. Okay, so any questions before I go on the next things? Okay, are the scope of variables that are declared for a parallel region to be given only if they are overwritten in the loop? Um, it's just good practice to give the scope of all of, of, of any variables that occur within the, the parallel region. Yeah, so if you have like some random variable that you're not using in that region, then it's totally fine not to scope it. But anything that is gonna be within that region, you definitely wanna scope. That's my advice. Okay, so let's do this. Using OpenMP. Um, so you remember how I told you you could write a single source code to use it with or without OpenMP? So basically those pragmas, like I said, they're just ignored if OpenMP is disabled, okay? But then what about those runtime library routines? Well, there's this nifty macro. It's kind of like a variable, but it's called a macro. Uh, that is defined if OpenMP is available. So you can use this to uh, conditionally include omp.h, the header file, or and also to redefine runtime library routines if, if you're not using OpenMP. So this is an example. So if that macro underscore OpenMP is defined, then I'm going to include omp.h. Otherwise, Somewhere in my code here, I use OMP get thread num. I'm just going to define that to be zero. Okay. And then that way, int me equals zero. Okay. Automatically. It just, I mean, what these macros do and stuff is it just kind of like says, okay, whenever you see this thing, OMP get thread num, it really means zero. <laughs> That's what these macros do, is they just do it. It's just an easy way to make substitutions. All right. Uh, okay, so now if you want to use OpenMP, uh, most of your compilers support OpenMP directives today. Um, they may not be on to version five, but they should probably have at least 4.5 enabled in most of them out there. Uh, and so you just enable it using compiler flags. So for the Intel compiler, which is the default compiler on Cori, uh, it's going to be minus Q OpenMP. So when we compile our code, we're gonna to have to add this flag when we compile it, if we're using OpenMP. All right, um, so uh, running programs with the directives. So you can just set your OpenMP environment variables in your batch script. Um, so you can, you can do something like this, export OMP underscore num underscore threads is four. Uh, so this is kind of the way that we, uh, that, that you would need to do it on Cori. Um, now, all of these things get kind of confusing. Like, what does this OMP places mean? What does that mean? What does OMP proc bind mean? I don't, I don't know, and neither do you, and that's okay. Uh, so my recommendation is we have this job script generator. 
And you can look at that and it'll automatically tell you all the things that you need to put into your JavaScript for best results. All right. Let's see, we have a Okay, so um, no surprise, our next thing is um, computing pi with OpenMP. Okay, so somebody asked me a question. Why is OMP num threads needed? when we pass the number of threads with SRUN. Okay. Um, so what you pass with SRUN is, um, I guess you're really passing the, the potential possible number of threads, right? And if you, if you have OMP num threads set to one, well, not set, it, then it's set to one, and then um, you won't have any threads. Um, so, that is why you would need to change. You would need to set OMP num threads, is so that OpenMP can understand that. Um, so that doesn't get translated in any other way um, uh, by SRUN. SRUN will won't tell it how many threads to use without that variable being set. Okay, excellent question. So the idea here now is we want to write it in OpenMP. Okay. Um, so what kind of, um, how can we do this? Uh, what pitfalls could we encounter? Um, and so there are some really bad pitfalls that we will encounter if we don't think about this really hard. So we wanna parallelize using OpenMP. Um, unfortunately, we are a little bit low on time. So I'm gonna to have to figure out how we can best do this. Um, okay, so MPI does translate, yes. Yes, so whatever you send in um, for M MPI wise, whatever goes through um, S alloc or um, S run, you know, or um, S batch. So whatever information it gets through there, MPI, yes, it'll work for that, but not open MP and I'm not sure why that is exactly. Okay. Um, so let's see, let's try and do this in a very short time. <laughs> and then um, and then we can, then we can go on to hybrid. <laughs> okay, um, let me see, let me just, okay. No, I wanna go here. All right, oh yeah, my job, I forgot to, <laughs> I forgot to get rid of my job. So it was still there and it was just idling for 30 minutes. Sorry about that. Okay, so now what I really need to do, um, let's see, I really need to copy my um, darts, sweet C, uh, darts, not C. I need to copy it here and make it called darts omp.c. Okay, so now uh, the thing, so we've got to include omp.h. Okay, yeah, we've got to include the omp.h so that we can use OpenMP uh, practices and directives and um, functions. So now this is the obvious thing that we are going to. Um, parallelize, right, is this loop, this loop. So we should be able to really just parallelize this basically, uh, okay, so let me just put a little note up here. This is the loop to parallelize, okay? And then we're going to um, uh, go back at this point down here. At this point, we are serial. Again. Okay. Does that make sense? So I've kind of demarked exactly where we are going to parallelize. And there's and we actually just need to have uh, one line for parallelization. So this is going to be pragma OMP 
parallel or reduction plus and circ. Oops, I think I need space here. Okay, now that is not correct. Whatever I just wrote there is probably not correct syntax. So I am going to go check on my syntax because I'm fairly certain it is incorrect. Yeah, okay, so in particular, I think I do not need this word for. Now I have the, I have this parallel right here because uh, I need to have a parallel region. So I believe, uh, so I could put pragma OMP parallel and then I could put pragma OMP reduction, but I could combine the two of them in this way. Now, um, something that I had to worry about is the private and the uh, shared variables, right? So what do I not, what do I want to be shared? Let's start with that shared. I want NSERC, right? Be shared. Is there anything else that I want to be shared? Oh, R, yeah, R squared, that's fine. And then I want um, private. Um, I need, so I need X to be private. I need Y to be private. Oh. I need anything else? Well, I is going to be private. You need but to be uh, private since your every iteration writes to it. I'm sorry, what? Don't you need NSERC to be private to avoid the race conditions? Uh, well, I need it to be shared because it's the thing that I'm reducing over. But you're also um, incrementing that with every iteration. Mm -hmm. so yeah. if, if you have two uh, threads, trying to increment the same thing once. Well, because it's the reduction variable, then um, OpenMP is going to take care of that. It's going to make sure that that um, nothing bad happens to NSERC, I think. All right, I see some comments people have. Let's see. Don't I want I to be shared? Uh, I do not want I to be shared because I is my index for my parallel loop. Should num trials be shared? Oh yes, thank you. Num trials should be shared. Thank you very much, that's good. Hmm. Anything else? I'm incrementing in circ. What does the plus and circ do? It reduces it. All right. <laughs> um, I. Um, uh, all right. I think I'm going to. Do something here for a second.
Okay, I don't want to waste a lot of time on me trying to figure this out. So I'm going to slightly cheat, which is I'm going to put the right answer in a different um, place. Okay, so I think I am actually Oh, I did, okay. I did need the four. Okay, so now um, another issue that we're gonna run into here is um, our random number generation. Okay, um, so we're using a shared random number library. Okay, question, does it really matter if num trials is shared or private? Its value is not being changed anywhere in the loop. Correct, it does not really matter, um, but let's say that we were short on memory then we would want it to be shared instead of private because um, if it's private, then everyone has a copy of it. Um, also, I should mention, we would need to make it first private rather than just private because we need it to be the number that it was when it came into the loop, okay? Because um, private, like X and Y, if, if we defined them before, if they were zero or whatever, they could be any value at this moment, like right when we entered into this loop, they could be a, they could be any value, um, and so they would they would be of undefined value. So that's really why we want it shared. We want it shared because it's easiest. Um, that way, we know um, that it keeps the same value that it had before it came in to the, to the loop, um, and we don't have to make a bunch of copies of it in case we're short on memory. That's an excellent question, though. Okay. Yeah. Go back to that the answer component and you know, uh -huh. again, if we are reducing it, why are we why is it why are we incrementing the shared variable? Wouldn't wouldn't we be then reducing, you know, basically aren't we gonna be adding it twice? Um you know, that's a really good question. Um, we could remove it from our shared list, but the thing is it's gonna implicitly be shared if we don't explicitly say that it's shared. And in my other solution, which is correct, uh, I, didn't put, I didn't put whether it was private or shared. I didn't put any shared actually in my other solution. So I think, uh, I guess that's, that's what I'm saying. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's a shared variable because uh, everyone's using it and it's being reduced upon and we only want one copy at the end. Okay, so what's the need to reduce upon it if everyone's already writing to it and at the end of the, at the, end of the loop, it's gonna have the, the total value. What's there to reduce? Um, I'm probably not explaining this well, and I don't know how to explain. Maybe I don't understand the reduction. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I guess basically, okay. There, there, there's another way that we could do this that would be a whole lot less efficient. Okay, and that way would be if we made everyone have their own private end circ, and then at the end we added them all together. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of what you're essentially proposing. Yeah. But what reduction does is OpenMP recognizes that NCIRC um, is something that uh, we are going to be adding a bunch of stuff to. Okay. And so uh, that way we can keep it as a shared variable um, that then all of the ranks can write to and all of the stuff about like not overwriting each other. Um, 
OpenMP is just going to automatically take care of that for us because it's this special kind of like protected variable in the reduction, if that makes sense. I got you. Okay, good. All right. So I realized um, because I'm cheating um, that I need to have, I actually just need to do two separate things. And then I need to, to um, this, the lexical extent of my pragma OMP parallel is here. Wait, what just happened? Right here. Okay. Um, because I need to put something else in here. So, um, okay. Oh, why did I do that? Pragma OMP critical. So it is critical um, because we are sharing um, the LC generator here function. We have to make sure that, that only one thread does it at a time. Only one thread um, creates random numbers at a time. Otherwise, we can have a lot of duplicate random numbers um, in order for us to be able to use that um, same random number generator together. Okay. Um, and I think this should work except for I need to change this from in serial to in OpenMP. Okay, shall we try it? Anybody object to trying it out? Let's just give it a shot. Okay, so now when I do CC, I need to do minus Q OpenMP, and then I need to do Dart dash OMP dot C, and I need to do RSO Dart dash OMP. Oh, no, oh, hold on. Okay, maybe I, I think maybe it was supposed to just all be one thing. Q on. Okay. Oh, shared clause in, oh, incompatible with directive. Interesting. All right, well, Eugene, maybe you were right and I was wrong about actually specifying it. Let's see, if I just remove insert, that seems like it's the likely thing, but maybe I don't, maybe not. Oh, it just doesn't like shared. Well, that explains why I didn't put a shared before. Okay. See, we're all learning here today. All right, it did compile now. All righty, now um, it's a lot of nonsense that I have to put into here that none of us understand, like I said. Uh, okay, so I need to export OMP places equals threads. Don't ask what that has to mean, I don't even know. Export, uh, what is it the next one? OMP proc bind equals spread. Then let's do export OMP num threads equals one. Let's try one. <laughs> and 
then um, I actually don't need to use srun. So I can, because I'm not using uh, uh, MPI and I'm on my own node, so I'm, I'm cool. So I can just do um, darts OMP. Yeah, that's all I have to do. See how it works. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay, now let's let's uh, change our OMP num threads to um, 68, and then run it again. Let's see if we get the same incorrect answer that we were getting before. Oh, we got. Uh, oh, okay. I see. We got the same answer, um, and that's just because uh, basically we. We parallelize this, but also it's pretty sequential because we have protected that LC generator part. So that's why it is um, getting the same answer because it, it is effectively using the same um, the same um, generator uh, random number generator that the that, that the single threaded version is using. Okay, any questions about that? So we've got like um, six minutes left, unfortunately for us. Um, but I would really like to just at least talk about um, hybrid programming if we can, if we can just do that. It, it won't take that long. We will go over time. I'm very sorry about that. But uh, hopefully not too bad. So. Hybrid programming. This is my favorite part, actually, and then it's you know the very last part, of course. Um, so we want to talk about our motivation for doing it, th things we needed to think about, um, MPI threading support, um, designing hybrid algorithms, and then some examples. So uh, we've got these multi-core architectures, which you know we we talked about it this morning. So uh, on the macro scale. They look like a distributed memory and they're perfect for MPI. Uh, on the micro scale, each node looks like an SMP machine. And so it's perfectly suitable for OpenMP. So if we wanted to get the most out of our machine um, and, and using our architecture, then the obvious solution is to use MPI between nodes and OpenMP within a node. Um, and this is what's called a hybrid programming model. So, okay, that's awesome. But is hybrid programming always better? Uh, no, <laughs> not always. And especially if you are not good at programming it. Um, and then also it just kind of depends on the suitability of the architecture and the algorithm that you're trying to parallelize. So you can think of it like the accelerator model. So very similar to uh, using GPUs. It's, it's just the same sort of question. So, in an open in an open MP parallel region, you're going to be using the power of multi cores, and in a serial region, you're using only one processor. So, it, similarly to if you're offloading to a GPU, right, you're using that only for these things that you can use it for. So, if your code can exploit threaded parallelism a lot for uh, whatever your definition is of a lot then you should try hybrid programming. Otherwise, you should just leave it alone. <laughs> okay, so um, you wanna think about your hybrid parallel programming model. So one thing are, uh, are communication and computation uh, discrete phases of your algorithm? And there's no right answer. If they are or if they aren't, that's fine. Um, and can you make communication and computation overlap or do they already overlap? Um, it, again, no right answer, but if they do, that could be that could be a good good thing for a hybrid program. Um, and then think about communication between threads. So, would you want to uh, communicate only outside of parallel regions? So, would you want you? And, and when I say communicate, I'm talking about like a, a thread on one process on one MPI process communicating with a thread in a different MPI process. Um, so, would you want to communicate only when you're not threaded? Would you want to communicate um, by assigning a manager thread that would be responsible for inter-process communication? Or uh, would you want to let some of your threads perform inter-process communication? Or would you want to let all of your threads communicate with, with other processes? Like, you know, just like a huge free-for-all. 
you know, maybe there's a legitimate use for that. Who knows? Um, so luckily, the MPI 2 and above standards have four threading support levels. So the first one, well, the zeroth one, because we start at zero, is MPI thread single. And, and this is like when, when you're doing something MPI, you can only have one thread in existence. So this has to be in the joined parts of your code. Can't be in the forked parts. Okay, MPI thread funneled, that's number one choice. Um, and then you just have one kind of like manager thread and it's the only thread that can make MPI calls. Okay. And then um, the next one, next choice would be MPI thread serialized. So that means like when you're in an open MP parallel region, any of the threads can make MPI calls, but only one at a time. And then uh, the third or the fourth, depending on how you're counting, uh, is MPI thread multiple. And that's just no restrictions. Like any thread can send an MPI message at any time, it doesn't matter what their other friends are doing at the same time on the, you know, in the same MPI process, thread multiple. All right, and then, um, 0 0.5, <laughs> but it's really zero, is uh, MPI calls are not permitted inside of parallel regions. And so this is the same as MPI thread single. And that's the only thing you can do if you're using MPI one. Okay, but um, most of us don't have that restriction. Now, um, you may be asking yourselves, uh, what threading model does my machine support? So you can find that out. So this is a nifty code where you can find that out. So um, we're going to learn about this in a sec, but there's something called MPI init thread that you would use instead of MPI init if you want to use OpenMP in your code. Um, and then you can, uh, you can use that, you can query, and you can find out what level of support is available for your, for your MPI. Um, so I did this on Cori. Um, I ran it. And it will support level two of three levels. Okay, so back to this thing. It will support MPI thread serialized. Okay, now in reality, uh, you can do this. Uh, you can set a flag and it will support level three. However, it's not recommended on Cori. Okay, so this MPI init thread business. So you, instead of arg C and arg B, you do int required and int supported. Uh, and so required means what you want, the level that you want, and supported means the level that you get. So ideally, it would be equal to required. But if required is not available, it's going to return the lowest level greater than required. Um, and failing that, the largest level uh, that is less than required. Uh, and so if you use MPI init, that's equivalent to required equals MPI thread single. And honestly, for most purposes, that is probably fine. If you're running like something pretty fancy where you have pretty fancy algorithm, then uh, you might want to use MPI init thread. But if you're just running something where the only open MP that you're doing is you're, you know, you're just parallelizing some loops, and there's no communication involved there, then really MPI thread single is just fine. Now, um, if you do MPI init thread, and then eventually you're gonna do MPI finalize um, at the very end of your program, you need MPI finalize to be called by the same thread that called MPI init thread. But uh, hopefully what happens is you, you close out your parallel region and then you call MPI finalize. At least I hope that's what you do. <laughs> if you don't, this is gonna be a really interesting program. Okay. Uh, so there's some additional MPI functions that can be super useful if you're doing this. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the first one is called MPI is thread main. And so this calls, the thread would call this to figure out if it's the main thread. So like, like I said, with the MPI finalized has to be called by the main thread that it called MPI thread in it. Um, so that's, that's how you can figure out which one is going to be the one that calls it. Um, also, you can do MPI query thread, and this 
where is the level of, of thread support. And that way you can have different algorithms depending on the level of thread support that's available. Okay. So if you're in the single model, so you wanna use the, uh, the single pragma. So if you're gonna do some kind of MPI thing within your parallel region, then you would put in this pragma OMP single where only the master, the manager thread um, can do the MPI thing, whatever that thing is. Okay. Um, and typically we put barriers around it just for simplification. Um, if you're in funneled, um, so the Cray implementation, and also we have an in, Intel MPI implementation on the machine, um, and they support funneling. Um, so you use the, the master pragma. And so um, in that case, you just have, it's just kind of the same thing that we had last time here, except for instead of single, it's master. So it's just a master that is, that is doing that. Um, and unfortunately, they haven't renamed master to be manager, but they really should. Um, okay, then if you are talking about the serialized version of, of uh, threading support, um, and okay, again, the Cray and Intel MPI implementations, they support this. Um, you just use the single pragma. So this means everybody can do it. If you recall, single means uh, everybody can do it. Just need to do it one at a time. Okay, and you don't need a barrier afterwards. Okay. Okay, and then multiple. So the actually on the machine, the Intel MPI implementation does support multiple. Um, and the Cray MPI, you can turn it on, but uh, they they tell you that the performance is not necessarily good. And I think likewise the Intel MPI, like it it'll work, but like uh, you know they've they've tested it the best they can, but they're not really hundred percent sure that it really is thread safe. So um, if you're in this case, if you're in multiple, then you don't need any pragmas to protect your MPI calls. It'll just, um, it'll just work. <laughs> Works all magically, it's all great. Uh, there are some constraints though. Uh, the, the ordering of MPI calls uh, needs to be maintained within each thread, but not necessarily across MPI, the MPI process. Um, so, you're responsible for preventing your own race conditions. Okay, so that's a little bit of a scary responsibility. Uh, and then blocking MPI calls will block only the calling thread. It won't block the whole MPI process, just that sub thread within the process. Um, multiple is like rarely re actually required. Uh, most algorithms you can write without using uh, multiple. So I would try to avoid it if I could because like I said, they, you know, a lot of these implementations, they say, oh yeah, we implemented it, but there's no guarantee that it really works well. Uh, so it's probably best to just kind of not use basically experimental stuff in your code, if you could avoid it anyway. Okay. So then you might be saying, okay, that's great, Rebecca, but which one should I actually use? Well, it, the answer is a resounding, it depends. So, um, you know, single is a really good model because every MPI implementation supports single, which means basically it doesn't support threading at all, except for, you know, within your, you know, you have a do loop and, you're, and you've, and you've uh, parallelized that. And that, if, if that's all you're doing, then single is great. Um, but it, it is kind of limited in the flexibility. So if you're trying to do some fancy things, um, you probably can't do that with the, the single model. Um, the funneled model, you know, it's it's pretty good. You know, it's it's simpler to program than some of these other ones. Um, one problem is you've got this manager thread that is one who has to do all the work. So they could uh, they could get a little overloaded uh, if, if you're doing that. Um, the serial, okay, you have a lot more freedom to communicate. So again, serial means everybody can communicate. They just have to do it one at a time, single file. Uh, and so that's good too, but you, you run the risk of having too much cross communication if, if you're doing it that way. And then um, multiple, you know, is completely thread safe. Uh, and it, the problem there though, is it's kind of limited in availability and has kind of suboptimal performance where it does exist. And uh, thread safety, 
is kind of your responsibility. Like I was saying, like, it's up to you to make sure that all of your threads are thread safe. <laughs> so I, I don't know that I would want to take on that awesome responsibility myself, especially in a very complex algorithm. I don't think that would maybe be such a great plan for me personally, but maybe, maybe you could do it just fine. And I don't want to, I don't want to um, step on your dreams or anything. <laughs> so you got to pick what's best for you. All right. So another thing is, um, you know, I'm mom. So this is one of the things I say to my, my son, you know, like if all your friends were jumping off a cliff, would you jump too? Right. So just because you can communicate thread to thread, I mean, that sounds really exciting and fun, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you should. So there's this kind of a trade-off between, you know, sometimes it's better to just save up all your messages and then send them instead of sending individual messages. Um, you know, there's going to be less overhead with a lump, with a big lump of, of uh, messages. One big message has one overhead. Uh, individual messages, though, they could have less wait time potentially, you know, more immediate sending of, of the um, individual messages. Another big issue that people will run into is about programmability. So you're like, you're making this super cool algorithm and it's like the best algorithm of all times, but it'll be really great when you finally get it working, uh, you know, because it can just be a really big nightmare to just try to try to program these things uh, when it involves so many complex different forms of parallelism combined with MPI communications, it can just be really scary and difficult. So anyway, that's 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 my warning for you. Okay, so here's an example. So uh, a very common thing that that people do on a supercomputer is something called finite elements. And so you're using you're using this method called finite elements to compute something like you know the, the energy uh, you know the potential energy of the system or whatever okay uh, and so you just cut it up into pieces they're typically triangles or squares or something like that uh, and so when we partition our mesh we we're going to need to communicate between information about um, cells that are adjacent in the domain in the physical domain of the problem to uh, computationally remote neighbors, right? So if I own a block and, and you own a block of the, uh, of the domain, the mesh, um, then on the edge where my block touches your block, we're gonna have to do some communications, okay? So that's, so that's something that you kind of need to think about when you're designing these types of algorithms. So, and you gotta figure out like what's best for your purpose. Okay, so if we have a, so let's say we have this domain, it's a square because it's easy. Uh, and so we have four processors and they each have one quarter of the domain. Okay, then, um, then we, we decide we're going to have four threads. So we give, uh, we give a quarter of, our, of each of these processors domains to each one of their threads. Okay. So you can see there's some borders here, right? Like I have to communicate, you know, the answer on, on these blocks to uh, from P0 to P1 here. So that P1 can kind of figure out like what, to, you know, how to compute its answers on these blocks and vice versa. So uh, this is kind of like basically an overview of like what our communication structure might look like. So if we just, if we just do, something very simple, then we would just be communicating between processes. And that would represent kind of these, by this um, this thick purple line here. And it, that's kind of trying to rec, uh, kind of represent the degree of communication, like how much communication we would need to do. Okay. Uh, and then on the other hand, if we were gonna do more individualized communications, right? Then we would need to send the information from T0, not just to, uh, you know, P, from P0 T0 to P0 T, P1 T0, but also, you know, this one might need to know a little bit about it too. And so we'd have to do a little communication in that direction. Um, and so we're going to end up having more communication if we're doing it this way than we would if we just sent everybody information all at once. 
Okay, so it's just something that you got to think about. So there could be an advantage to doing it this way. You know, you could get faster results. You could, uh, you know, be able to access that information more quickly or something. But it does involve quite a bit of overhead, um, unless you can overlap communication and computation. All right. So that's kind of my example for you there. Um, so uh, if you like OpenMP, which I know you all do now, um, I can recommend this book. Uh, so I don't know if you, some of you all re recognize this name of somebody who taught you a class last week, Helen He. So she's in my group. She works for me and she helped to write this book called the OpenMP Common Core. And it's pretty awesome. And it tells you all about kind of what they call the common core of OpenMP. So the simplest parts that 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 cover like 80% of what anybody ever does with OpenMP. So I would recommend that book if you want to read about that. Um, and then there's a lot of other stuff. Um, Lawrence Livermore also has a really good OpenMP tutorial. Um, yeah, and there's some just some other really good sites and, and good um, good stuff to, to look at, resources, um, trainings, things like that. Um, this one I thought was a pretty funny name. OpenMP Crash Course, How to Parallelize Your Code with Ease and Inefficiency. <laughs> I thought that was cute. Um, OpenMP.org, you can go there, you can read the standards, um, you can see some specification and code examples of those. And then um, for hybrid programming, there's a lot of good resources out there as well. I recommend all of those. And then of course, that's, that would be where we would now do our um, uh, hybrid program. So we would combine OpenMP and MPI into one program. And I think because of the time, because it's 3.15 now, 15 minutes past, I will leave that as an exercise to the reader. Um, but if you're interested in learning how to actually compute Pi, um, I have this, this is gonna tell you how to compute Pi. Um, if you're interested in about random number generation, um, that's also a fascinating subject, I think. Um, and so I have a little bit on that too and about how bad our random number generator is. So it is one of these linear congruential generators and one of the most famous ones is called Randu. And uh, it had a lot of correlations as you can see in this, uh, in this graph of, of the numbers that it comes up with. So there you go. Uh, if you wanna use an actual good standard random number generator, uh, the Mersenne Twister is one of the top ones. Uh, GSL, GNU Scientific Library has it. Um, also, Intel MKL has it. And then for parallel codes, there's something called Spring, which is the leading parallel pseudo random number generator. And uh, that's all I've got. So, any questions? Can I take some quick questions? Well, Rebecca, before you get the questions, uh, thank you very much for, for this, for doing this. Oh, yeah. Well, it was super fun. I'm sorry we went way over time. And thank you all the participants for the, for joining us and in particular those who stayed until the very end. Yes, yes. Thank you for sticking around, you 41 devoted participants. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate you coming, especially on a Friday and sticking around on a Friday afternoon or evening for some of you. So. So yeah, thanks again. And I think we are done, Andrew.